pounds of sugar per year, or 82 grams of sugar per day, more than four times the recommended amount. This includes both traditional refined sugar as well as high fructose corn syrup, which was developed in the 70s as a cheaper alternative. While high fructose corn syrup is often cast as worse than traditional sugar, their chemical components are identical, and science has shown that our bodies respond the exact same way to either substance, so we'll refer to both sucrose and high fructose corn syrup as just sugar. But how did we get here? The sugar revolution started with beets, or beet sugar to be exact. The refining process was first developed in Germany and improved on in France during a British blockade meant to cut Napoleon off from outside trade. This allowed sugar to be grown and processed in Europe for the first time. Before this, all sugar came from sugarcane, which only grows in tropical climates and requires intensive labor to harvest. By 1880, beets had surpassed sugarcane as the leading supply of refined sugar. At the same time, technical advances during the Industrial Revolution made refining sugar faster and cheaper. By 1920, a refinery processed millions of pounds of sugar in a single day, which would have taken an entire decade just 100 years earlier. Enter the four horsemen of the sugary apocalypse. Candy, chocolate, ice cream, and soft drinks. All four industries appeared in the 19th century with sugar as their defining ingredient. Candy, chocolate, and ice cream had been around for centuries, but were only made in small batches. The Industrial Revolution provided the processing machines, freezers, industrial wrapping, and cheap sugar that allowed these sweets to be mass-produced for the first time. Soda was something new altogether. First sold as patent medicines, these over-the-counter remedies required no prescription and often made wild claims about their healing abilities. Sugar was later added to give the drinks a better taste. This was the eureka moment that created a multi-billion dollar industry. Coca-Cola, Pepsi, and Dr. Pepper, known as the Big Three, each began their meteoric rise at the end of the 19th century. Combined, these companies are now worth over $350 billion. The 20th century was famously rocky, with two world wars and a Great Depression thrown in for good measure. But if you think that's enough to slow sugar consumption, you're wrong. Despite massive unemployment and food shortages, average sugar consumption increased by 16 pounds from 1920 to 1933. Turns out that for people with little else, sweets were a small and cheap vice, seemingly worth the price. During World War II, the U.S. government rationed its citizens to 70 pounds of sugar per year, but at the same time allotted 220 pounds to soldiers. Many in the government saw sugar as a stimulant that made American soldiers more effective in combat. The candy and soda industries took advantage of this belief, supplying the armed forces with massive amounts of sweet treats. Coca-Cola went so far as to promise their soda to servicemen at a nickel per bottle anywhere in the world and often at a loss. To make this possible, the company set up 64 bottling plants worldwide with the help of the U.S. government. This not only increased their loyal customer base when those servicemen returned home, but facilitated Coca-Cola's transformation into an international brand, saving the company millions. After the war, sugar returned home stronger than ever before. Refrigerators and freezers allowed families to store ice cream and soda in bulk. And it was at this time that a whole new sugar frontier opened up, breakfast. Soon fruit juice and sweet cereals would become staples, taking what had been a hearty meal and injecting it with massive amounts of sugar. Brands marketed their juices as healthy by focusing on vitamins and minerals. Similarly, cereal companies argued that their sugar-coated cereals helped kids drink milk. They went so far as to create cartoon mascots and even entire TV shows dedicated to selling their cereal to the young and vulnerable. Today, the average child consumes almost 50% more sugar than the average adult. This covers what could be called the desertification of the human diet. Sugar's here, but is it here to stay? Only time will tell.
Thank you, Zoe, and DJ Manny for that. That was an incredible way to start. I'm Adam Butler. This is my brother, Marty Butler. Hello. We're, we're the local boys that they, they bring in to keep this thing Austin fried, right? Yes. And um, welcome to Escabona, everybody. It's year three, and it's a privilege and a pleasure to be here with all of you, especially the people that are already here this morning, because we're, we're missing a few folks. I think people got carried away with the nice weather and the good fun of Austin. So come on in if you're out in the garage and having coffee. In the garage right now, there is an iPad that you can, at your leisure, and if you're feeling generous, give a donation to uh, what's going on in uh, Puerto Rico. There's a fundraising effort that we're a part of that everyone here generously uh, agreed to participate in from a leadership standpoint. But do you have anything else to say about that? No, it's just wonderful that the folks of New Hope and, and Escobona are thinking about that and, and have made it easy for all of us to give. So please do so if you have a chance. And, and if you haven't had a chance to go to the garage in general, there's, there's a lot of great exhibitors uh, from the local area. And we, and we suggest getting in there and spending a little time. Great. So, Marty, what are we going to talk about? High-level themes, and then I'll do a little deep dive. Hunger. Hunger. So, we believe good food is a right, not a privilege. And Shen Tong spoke briefly about that last night. Uh, that it's a broad, it's a broader subject than just access. It's about nutrition and the quality of what people are eating, not just getting something. Supply chain. So we'll we'll hear about that a lot. We're going to work on that as a group in the fix, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. What else, Marty? Big and small. So Biggie Smalls, big and small. Big, Biggie Smalls. Um, yeah. There's a really good uh, show on right now called The Defiant Ones. Highly recommended. Did some, I just got a yes back there. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's so good. But it's super inspiring. Um, it's a total <laughs> side tangent. But big and small, I think, is about not not seeing each other as diametrically opposed and seeing each other as, as we talked about last night, finding the middle and, and ways of collaboration where we have expertise that we can share with one another. Um, there's a, and I'm going to do the Brene Brown breakdown real quick because I wanted to say something earlier and it, it's, this is a good place to talk about courage over comfort. That's her new, kind of her new slug line for her new book and I, I had the pl pleasure of seeing her speak here in Austin a few weeks ago now. And courage over comfort, I think, is a great mantra for the entire time that we're going to be together for the next two days because it's the little things, not just the big kind of illustrious statements of courage that matter a lot. Saying you don't know something, like Marty and I, there's, there's so much we don't know. We know we're brothers, but, but there's a lot, we have a lot to learn in this conference, too, and that's one of the reasons we, we, it's a privilege for us to be a part of it is because we get to learn a lot by being here. So not being afraid to ask a dumb question. Um, not being afraid to think that just because someone's from a big company that their heart and their values aren't in the same place as a small insurgent companies might be. Uh, so just the courage of, of being vulnerable. Yeah, and, and I think what you're talking about is what can generally lead to deeper dialogue with each other if we're a little bit more vulnerable, if we choose to take that moment to meet someone new and move away from the small group that we might be with we might have the opportunity to make a new connection that really changes us or inspires us to do something that's next in our lives, right? Absolutely. And that, that's a good segue to the last one, which is the role of technology. <laughs> because that's where the trolls live. No, but I mean, <laughs> um, but technology, our father, our father once famously quipped uh, after getting busted planning a beer party on the answering machine, that, you know, the, the tape answering machine that we didn't think was on. He said, you know, son, Sometimes technology hurts us as much as it helps us. And we're like, what do you mean, Dad? He's like, let me play the tape. And, um, so technology's great, but it can also be used uh, inappropriately. And we'll talk about the nuances of that statement, too. Absolutely. Um, you want to talk about the fix? Yeah, let's talk about the fix, because we have 17 seconds to talk about the fix. OK, so the fix, um, this is going to be a great opportunity. There's seven companies in the fix this year. Is that right, Carlotta? Six. Six. Marty and I are going to put our own company in the fix this year. Uh, <laughs> six companies in the fix. There's going to be an opportunity uh, today to engage and work one-on-one -on -one and share your knowledge 
courageously with those companies. But also, you know, anytime you're teaching something, you're always learning something. So let's really engage in the fix. Uh, there'll be more said about that later. And our time is at zero, so we want to be respectful of the space and the time. And uh, Marty, we have an introduction to make. Uh, Pete Speranza, is he next? I believe. Come on up. Marty, you want to come over here? Maybe. Pete, you have a mic. Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah. How's it going? Good. Good nice morning. To see you. Nice to see you. Hi, Pete. Nice to see you guys again. Yeah, yeah. I'm going <laughs> to jump up. Is everything? Let's see. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I just lost it. There you go. Hi. Um, this is, uh, I didn't think I was going to start this morning, actually. And it's a bonus, re really, to your programming because it's not on there. So if you're looking for me, I, I wasn't on the program. But, <clears throat> but they were asking me a little bit of how do you talk about or think about courage. Just this whole uh, two days are really about courage uh, around the food system, around courage, right? Around entrepreneurism, around uh, leadership, right? In the food world. Uh, so I, I, as I was stepping back and thinking about it, right, what, what am I going to talk about, right? I, and, I, and I'll tell you who I am in a second, but uh, I, I was thinking about the food entrepreneurs, right? Because those are the guys that are with all the courage, right? They're, they're the ones without the net that are trying to create these new ideas and launch them and do them in uh, entrepreneurial ways, I'll call it, uh, and, and get them out to the, to the masses. Um, they're the ones that actually see the trends first, right? They're the ones that see what consumers are really looking for and, and actually give them the products that they're looking for. So, so those guys are really the guys that are with all the courage uh, in my mind in the food space. But, but I'm uh, Pete Speranza, uh, <coughs> a 20 year veteran actually at uh, General Mills. Um, one of the founders of 301 Inc, uh, which is a, a venture arm basically of, of General Mills where we put minority stake investments in food brands um, and really team up with them in a way that we use our expertise to help them scale and actually get their products to more people is basically the idea behind it. Um, and uh, as I think about, here, we'll talk about this for a second. Um, this is not new news, right? The, what, what's going on in the food industry. Um, and I call it a revolution more than evolution. Uh, evolution, actually, uh, most of the food businesses can keep up with it, right? Because it's evolving, right? It's going slower. The revolution that's going on is, is the speed. Uh, and it's back to, Actually, the two brothers here talking through uh, technology and information flow and uh, learning and, and, and tech, uh, science and things like that. But in reality, it's moving so fast, right? And it's all around changing food values. Um, and it's not a millennial thing, right? It's happening to all of us. We're all thinking differently about food. Um, think about food as proactive nutrition, right? I don't want to take pills when I get older. I'd rather figure out how to eat food that actually gives me the nutrients that I need to, to be healthy. Um, simple, not science, right? I'd rather only have an ingredient or two in my product if I could. Uh, who cares about shelf life, right? I'd rather have a shorter shelf life and less ingredients and whole food in my body every day. Um, trust and uh, this transparency, right? Uh, for the big food companies, it was a little bit around you build a brand and that builds trust, right? Especially around food safety and things like that. In reality, transparency is where it's going. You'd rather buy some local at a local farmer's market and you're totally fine with it, right? You don't know where they made it or not, but it, it, the point is that it's local, it's fresh, it looks like there's a lot, not a lot of ingredients, um, and you'll eat it you know, within days or two, so, so it's good, and it's gonna be good. Um, but it's the way you're thinking, the mind shifts uh, uh, on how you think about trust, uh, uh, transparency of supply chain, right? Knowing where those ingredients come from, or even knowing what the ingredients are, and then knowing actually what they do for you. Um, you know a lot more today than you ever knew before, right, from an ingredient standpoint. And then the consumer opinions matter, right? They've always mattered, but, but the social side of it, right? If you think about, uh, if you buy anything online, or, or anywhere actually for that matter, you actually look for like the five stars now for almost anything you do. And if you have a one star on a product, no matter what it is, you actually probably won't buy it. Uh, if you saw one star and there's probably over 100 people that actually gave it a review. That's a whole different world that there's ever been before, right? That's a whole marketing play if, if, you, if you think about it. And that's transparency in reality, right? You're all friends and families, your neighbors are giving opinions on products and it shapes the way you purchase things. So it's a totally different world, right? So it's changing and it's ever changing. Um, so if you think about this world, what this world creates, and, and I love it because it creates choice, right, for consumers. 
uh, it, it actually allows consumers to get what they want, right? And there's more products on shelf today than there's ever been before. And there's a reason behind it. It's because consumers wanted choice and the customers finally brought it to them. And it's through things like this that actually enabled it. Uh, and you can talk about technology and we can talk about better for the earth and better for you kind of products. And that's obviously all important. And you want to know the story behind the entrepreneur and things like that. That's super important as well. Uh, but the point is that all this stuff has enabled us to actually get more choice and market around our food system, which is great, right? <clears throat> so now think of the entrepreneurs, because there's going to be a lot more entrepreneurs, food entrepreneurs actually, especially in this space than ever, right? Um, you know, as I think about even the food industry, it's a little bit like how the tech industry is today. That's where the food industry is moving, right? Where you're going to get a lot of your innovation externally. Um, you know, the apples of the world and others, they know they're not going to like, make all their innovation by themselves. They're going to find the technology and things that enable them to actually get to where they need to go. Um, and that's exactly where the food industry is going. So there are going to be a lot more entrepreneurs in the food space than there ever has been before. There is already, but even in the future there will be uh, more and more. Um, but as you think about entrepreneurs, or even food businesses for that matter, because it's food businesses are very tough to run, right? They're very tough to actually manage from scratch and actually build a brand, make sure your product's safe, make sure it gets to the product or to the to the customer intact, you know, without uh, the package being open or contaminated, things like that. Um, there's a lot more to think about in the food business or in the food world than than any other uh, sector, actually, uh, if you think about that. Um, and then if you, I'll, I'll go back to the entrepreneur. Then if you. Think about, uh, uh, this is a book actually, The Dip. I don't know if, uh, if anybody in this room has read the, the book, but you should, if, especially if you're an entrepreneur. It gives you some good uh, insight on kind of the, the cycle that you'll be going through uh, probably every three to six months. Um, and it's really around, there'll be points in time when you're running your business where you're feeling like you're trying as hard as you possibly can and you're not getting very far. And there's a lot of reasons behind it, right? And there, it could be the way you're managing cash flow, the way you're thinking about your ingredients, the way you're trying to go to, to the consumer, um, your price point, um, all those dynamics that you're trying to work on to figure out what is the perfect thing that the consumer really wants. That's what you're chasing, and that's what people are moving to actually get to find it. Um, but you will go through these dips. And the point is that you've got to fight through them, and most entrepreneurs do. Um, but there are a bunch that don't because they can't make it because they didn't get cash flow or they don't have the idea that they thought they had or the consumer didn't like the idea at that price point. <clears throat> so you lose a lot of them uh, through this process as well. But if you can make it through there and you have a great idea and you're chasing the right one, the right idea, um, you know, you can make it big and you can hit, get your big goal, right? And you can be a, a sustainable uh, product on shelf that actually benefits and helps consumers, right? That's at the end of the day what we're doing here. Um, so as I, as 301 Inc, but even as Pete's Brands as a person, especially in the local area of Minnesota, I'm from Minneapolis, um, I was thinking a lot about it and you're like, you know what, the, the reason behind what entrepreneurs do day in and day out, <laughs> you know, they're always looking for help, right? They're always figuring out, all right, at every stage of my business, I need some help. I'm not an expert in every part of the running a business. I need help. So the, the way I thought about it and the way I uh, go about it is actually how do you support the ecosystem, right? How do you create the visibility of the experts in the area that you live in and how do you actually get them closer to the entrepreneurs that they can help them out? Um, so we've, I've done a lot of work around it uh, and Angie from Angie's Popcorn over there has done some work with me as well in the local area. But um, Minnesota Cup, I'll talk about that just for a quick second. Um, we created a food division of Minnesota Cup. It's the largest innovation competition in the country. Um, it's a $50,000 prize money actually for the winner. But, but in reality, we highlighted food. We wanted four years ago, we we're like, let's surround the food uh, entrepreneurs so they actually have a platform to talk about their ideas, but also get their ideas out so then the, all their resources around in the, in the state of Minnesota can actually help them and, and build their businesses with them. Um, that wasn't doing, it wasn't going as well as it, as it should and I, I seen that and I was like, you know what, we got to create some venues actually to connect the dots here. So we created this food division in Minnesota Cup. <clears throat> 300 entrepreneurs or businesses have come through it in four years. Um, and, and everyone gets a mentor and everyone gets some help through, through the process. It's like a boot camp, right, for business plan uh, boot camp. 
Um, then we created something called Grow North, um, and it was really just stealing for, with pride from Boulder and looking at Naturally Boulder. And we took a group from Boulder and uh, from Minnesota to Boulder, the Ag Department, the University, uh, entrepreneurs, and a bunch of other folks. And really what we did was say, all right, how did Boulder become so famous for natural and organic food products? And that they support entrepreneurs in that way. There's a lot of people that actually move there just because of that ecosystem to help support them uh, build, a, build a company. So basically we said, you know what, we should just do the same. We, we have all the resources in Minnesota. We have all, some of the biggest food companies in the world sit there. But how do you get those resources to actually be connected to the entrepreneur, not just for a boot camp or for three months, but year round, right? So this Grow North was created to actually help figure out and connect those dots day in and day out and actually get more connections between the, the support basically and the entrepreneurs. Um, and then 301 Inc., the way we thought about it for a while, we're like, you know what, we definitely want to give back more than we ever receive in this space. Um, you know, we are part of this fabric of this, of this ecosystem, innovate, food innovation ecosystem, I'll call it. And it's like, how do we give back? Um, so we spent a lot of time thinking through it, and in reality, when we looked around our, even our own building, we were like, all right, we have 200 commercial kitchens in our building. Why can't we help the local entrepreneurs with all this? you know, just equipment that's sitting around, right? So we actually brought some entrepreneurs into our building that are from Minnesota and actually just helped them, just rented some space out, gave them some equipment, um, and really just gave them a helping hand, right? It wasn't anything to do about investing or anything about General Mills, it was all around just giving the local brands some help as they were trying to figure out where do I actually make my product? And how do I do it in a food safe way? Um, so we helped them figure that out. Um, and then Fab Loki, it's, uh, it's an acronym for, uh, the food and beverage, uh, and, and really it's a traveling show. And it's a, some that uh, we put together with uh, VEB Coke, which is another venture arm uh, for, for Coke. And we basically go city by city. <laughs> and what we do is we invite 60 to 70 food entrepreneurs, food and bev entrepreneurs in a room just for one night. And it's really around just getting them together, right? And a lot of them, as they walk in the room, they're like, oh my God, I didn't know that all these people are doing the same thing as I am in my, within a five mile radius. Um, and it's really allowed them to step back a little bit and go like, yeah, here's a lot of people that can actually help you build your business that are just right here, right around the corner. Um, so we actually go city to by city, and we were in London to start. We went to LA uh, in the US, went to New York, Chicago, and now we're going on to Miami, and it's really just around how do you actually help support the local food uh, ecosystem? And how do you get them thinking a little bit differently around the support that they have in the area, and actually what are they missing, and what do they need, and what do they think they're missing when they really have it, they just haven't really connected those dots yet. Um, so we've really been helping out a lot in a lot of the local cities, actually, to try to get food entrepreneurs basically connected to resources. <clears throat> That's our inspiration on entrepreneurs and the challenges that they're going after, and how do, we, how do we help them, right? In a differentiated way, not really in a business way, but in more of a community way. <clears throat> so here's the challenge I'll throw out to you guys. Really for the entrepreneurs first. This is back to what I mentioned earlier, is let the consumer choose who, who are the winners, right? At 301 Inc, we always tell our brands that are in our portfolio, we're like, you know what, you, we cannot make consumers like your product. <laughs> We can get you there more efficiently as you're trying to learn and understand who those consumers are. But at the end of the day, the consumers are gonna choose. But how about have that be the end game more than you lost because you don't have cash flow, you didn't think about food safety, you forgot about how to get things over a border, uh, you know, just all the basics of running a business, right? How do you get help and how do you actually make sure you're open enough in your community to get that help? so you don't get caught in that situation and actually lose your business because you, of something else outside the con consumer choosing that it wasn't a good idea. So here's my challenge is just think through that. And especially in your local area, there's a l tons more help than you probably even think. And just think about it and, and look around and I'm sure you'll find help and support. Um, it's, 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 it's there, it's just sometimes uh, lying in the weeds a little bit and you gotta pull it up. Uh, for the enablers, and that's the other folks that are in this room. I'm an enabler, right? We're enablers to entrepreneurs, actually. Uh, most of the folks in this room that are not entrepreneurs. And um, how do you give more than you receive, right? So how do you think about the local entrepreneurs in your area? How do you think about even in this room here today as entrepreneurs or other folks are in each one of these rooms telling their stories, telling their, their uh, challenges that they have and other things? You know, step up. You know, think about your expertise, think about your years of experience, and be like, you know what, I can actually help that brand. Even if it's a five minute call, 
even if it's just an hour conversation, whatever it is, but it's worth it, right? And there's more entrepreneurs out there than ever before, like I mentioned. There's more th uh, expertise that actually is out there as well. It's just connecting the dots and actually making it uh, thrive in a sense to actually get these entrepreneurs where they need to be. Um, that's really all I have, so. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Pete. Good job. Pete Speranza, thank you very much. Yes. Have a great day. We're a platform partner for Escobona 301 Inc. Next, we're gonna bring up an artist named Lauren Nixon, who comes to us from Washington, D.C. And Lauren is gonna be a recurring character today to help us be inspired. Like Zoe helps us move our body, Lauren will help us move our soul, move our spirit, and be inspired. Welcome to the stage, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Lauren Nixon. I'm a food educator based in the DC area and I teach people about how to live a juicy life by cooking real, local, sustainable food from scratch. I'm gonna be opening with a quick reading uh, by Tamar Adler from her book An Everlasting Meal, Cooking with Economy and Grace. This is chapter 12, How to Build a Ship. She starts with a quote from Antoine de saint exupéry If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. There are times when I can't bear to think about cooking. Food is what I love and how I communicate love and how I calm myself. But sometimes without my knowing, it is drained of all of that. Then cooking becomes just one another, one of, of a hunger's jagged edges. So I have ways to take hold of this thing and wrest it from the claws of resentment and settle back among things that are mine. The first is remembering that ill-tempered as I am, I resent everything sometimes. I get infuriated by the weather and missed trains and missing buttons. I think that cooking must be allowed to swell cont to contemptible proportions when it seems contemptible just like other disproportionately terrible annoyances, and then allowed to shrink when it is time. The question is, how do you fall in love with it again? Or if it has never made you truly happy, fall in love with it for the first time. My answer is to anchor food to somewhere deep inside of you, or deep in your past, or deep in the wonders of what you love. We have different loves, mine are food and words, others are how buildings slant from dark sidewalks or how good it feels to solve an equation. I say let yourself love what you love and see if it doesn't lead you back to what you ate when you loved it. It helps me to think of meals I've cooked or eaten before, if not for the food, for the light in the room or in the sky when I ate what the light looked like or what music was playing. It doesn't take more than my opening a window, head lifted to the air for the sound of glass against a marble table. Or the rustle of the wind to remind me that I've sat at marble tables outside, drunk out of glasses, listened to their light clatter on the table, noticing a rustling wind. I may not remember what I ate, or whether it was the lunch where I realized I do not like black pepper to have been ground before I use it, or the one where I spilled water in my lap. But I will remember how the day felt on my face, and my creative soft self will have been awakened. So I listen hard, I listen with the purpose of remembering. In this digging into sounds and into days, I have heard and felt roots, future meals, and the unchangeable truths of past ones. Let smells in, let the smell of a hot tarmac in the summer remind you of a meal you ate the first time you landed in a hot place. Where the ground smelled like it was melting, let the smell of salt remind you of a paper basket of fried clams you ate once, squeezing them with lemon as you walked on a boardwalk. Let it reach your deeper interest. When you smell the sea and remember the basket of hot fried clams, and the sound of ski balls knocking against one another. 
let it help you love what food can do, which is to tie this moment to that one. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. I'd like to bring Carlotta Mass to the stage. Carlotta, where are you? <laughs> Carlotta's with New Hope, as probably everyone in this room knows, but um, she's, a, she's an inspiring person who has done a lot more than just lead with her brain on this event. She's led with her heart the whole time, so Carlotta, thank you. Thank you. Um, really appreciate Adam and Marty being here again. Really appreciate all of you. I know we had a lot of fun last night, and so thank you for showing up early this morning. And, and we are so grateful that you are part of Escobona. We know how many events there are for you, for you to attend. We know how busy um, and, and vibrant your businesses are, and lots of things, lots of choices that you can make. So we, we greatly honor you for being part of um, this choice. And normally when I'm on these stages, I talk about growth because the natural and organic food industry has quite a growth story to tell. But today I'm going to be a little more personal and I'm going to talk about McDonald's. Specifically, this McDonald's, which is located on Eisenhower Boulevard in Loveland, Colorado. I have not stepped into this McDonald's once in the last 20 years, but in the first 20 years of my life, I ate at this McDonald's hundreds of times. I even had many of my birthday parties at this McDonald's. You see, I was born in Colorado in 1972 to two lawyers who were very serious about their careers. My mom, actually, she was the second um, she was one of two women in her University of Colorado Law School class to graduate. And she was the first woman practicing attorney in northern Colorado. And over her 50-year legal career, she helped hundreds of people and their families as a small town family practice attorney. And as a trailblazing woman, she would you know, rely on anything that would help her to raise her three children and focus on her important work. This included daycare centers, infant formula, and of course, fast food restaurants. And although you know, some months were tighter than others, even though my parents were lawyers, they didn't make a lot of money, but it wasn't money that dictated my family's food choices, it was time. And when we'd go grocery shopping, you know, my mom, I think she had a little guilt, I think she also had a lack of time, but she'd just let me, my brother, and my sister loose in the store, and we could throw anything we wanted into the shopping cart. And these are the things we frequently threw into that shopping cart. Now, of course, my food choices changed pretty dramatically when I became a mother 14 years ago. And the more I kind of educated myself about nutrition and about the importance of what we put in our bodies, the angrier I actually became, mostly at my mom. And I had this question, how could she be so irresponsible when it came to feeding her children? And that question really troubled me. It troubled me greatly until I began working in this industry and began understanding truly, you know, how complex the issue of healthy eating really is. We all know what we should be doing for ourselves and our families, and yet what we, what we do, what we should do usually isn't easy, and for many people it's not even possible. I share this story because at this year's Escobona, we're using food stories as a way to begin to unpack the many forces from financial status to family culture to race and ethnicity that impact access to and acceptance of healthy food. We're focused on food access because it's a huge issue. Today, more than 50 million Americans don't know where their next meal will come from. They don't have access to food in general, let alone healthy options. 
as the divide separating the, ha the food haves and the food have-nots only continues to widen. And at the same time, our unhealthy eating habits have wreaked havoc on our well-being and our quality of life. Solving these complex problems while creating new opportunities for brands, retailers, communities, and individuals alike is the focus of this year's Escabona gathering. And over the next few days, we will explore, as, as Adam and Marty had said, you know, the lives behind the healthy food access problem and why these people and these families should be the focus of our industry and of the good food movement. We're going to talk about the role farmers play in healthy food access and the economic vitality that, can bring, that we can bring back to rural America by making our farmers part of the solution rather than part of the problem. We're going to look at why it will take big and small working together in new ways to bring more equality and equity to our food system. And of course, we'll talk about the role of technology, innovation, and influencers in igniting the consumer activation needed to fuel meaningful change. Of course, Escabona wasn't created just for you to sit out there and listen. You all are full equal and valued participants, and we've created several opportunities for you to get involved. For example, today at lunch, you'll have a chance to tell your own food story. And if sharing your truth feels uncomfortable, as it is for me to stand here and tell you how much fast food and junk food I ate as a kid and teenager, I encourage you to do it anyway. After all, as Brene Brown says, courage starts with showing up and letting ourselves be seen. So, as you participate in the next few days of Escabona, show up, be seen, think big, be generous with your ideas and expertise, meet new people, and find ways you can work together to help one another and serve a higher purpose, even if that means having to choose courage over comfort. There's so much work to be done. The world needs you, my mom needed you, and these people need you. It's kind of like a drug that you can't seem to shake and then the convenience, the convenience of it already being there. Something in my caveman brain <laughs> makes me want whatever I smell. We call that the evil smell because it, it lures people in. Nobody cooks it that much at home like it did when my mom was, when I was a little girl. People eat out now, it's fast food, it's microwave stuff. Everything's rush, 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 rush. I'm as guilty as everybody else. It's the strangest thing, sacrificing your health for convenience. But we do it, I don't know why. For convenience and price. Just right up the street here, they built a KFC. Instead of like, if you go in a certain neighborhoods, they have like Sprouts or they'll have like better options. But this one here, we got um, Popeyes instead of healthier options. They've got fried chicken covered. Yeah, we got it covered on every block. <laughs> My husband and I have two different shifts. So there's nobody here. Like right now, I'll be here the rest of the night by myself. So, yeah. ain't no need to cook it. Yeah. Grab something, come on home. <laughs> ain't no cooking. I like to go out. I, I like to go to restaurants. It's just the, the sights, the sounds, the smells, and just being around other people. Like a communal bonding kind of thing. It's just, it's just nice. I used to buy organic. When my finances changed considerably, I had to stop. It's, it's inconceivable that we have to make a certain amount of money or have a certain um, financial status to be able to afford decent food. It's not really an option, it's a dangling carrot when you can't afford it that I so wish I could have. I'm just, it's just keeping me in the Oliver position. 
I definitely try as, as much as possible to make everything organic or non-GMO. I want my kids to be happy and healthy. I don't want my kids to be sick all the time, and I just kind of make it work. I have a budget, and I kind of stick to it. Don't try to change who I am. Don't try to change how I was brought up. That's my roots. My mom always cooked the same thing all the time. And it was always like red beans and rice and fried pork chops, breaded pork chops. So that kind of reminds me of home. All that's fine, but the roux, it's nothing but oil and flour. But it's so good. <laughs> My last doctor told me you ought to just go vegan. And I'm like, I'm from the South. I'll never do that. It's really hard to change what I've done all my life. Growing up drinking Cokes every day, three times a day, eating ice cream, fatty food. I'm sure it just catches up with you over the years. And they always tell us, like, come on, come on, get on this program. And it's like, ah, I want to so bad. But then my life commitments kind of prohibits me. And a lot of my own excuses probably prohibits me too. You just feel like if you're not shopping in that organic section, it almost feels like everybody's looking at you like, oh, well, she's not really that healthy. And like, say if I see my neighbor in the grocery store or something, she might look in my basket and see what I have in there, you know, and oh, she doesn't eat very healthy. Like when you were in high school, like the popular girls. And so are they the high school mean girls? Kind of. <laughs> like this is what you should be doing, this is what, you should be eating, this is the way you should be doing it. Whether or not I have the self-discipline to do it, I have the knowledge, I know what the problem is, I think I know how to remedy it. Whether or not I can stay on that, I don't think I'll be able to. I'll, I'll try. Everything was fine up until um, about January of last year. No warning, it just kind of came on. Like I'd be typing on the computer and I would notice my hands would be shaking. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. So it got bad enough that a few months later in April, I went and had this blood test done and it came back that I was in the um, pre-diabetes stage. And I was like, oh, that's here, here we go. How did that make you feel? Scared, very scared. My mom, she's um, on kidney dialysis, and uh, that was set on by high blood pressure. I do try and, you know, watch what I'm gonna eat. I think a lot of people are kind of stuck in that mentality, like, you know, whatever, it, it doesn't matter, we're all gonna die one day, and it's like, don't you want a like, better quality of life while you're here? My brother had to have his toe amputated, um, and that scares me to death. Like, diabetes, like, oh! I just know that the food makes a big difference because I can tell, I can just tell when I eat it and then watching them just spiral downward into a sluggish couch potato thing that comes with crap food. When I don't have time to have actual good food, I just like, okay, let's order a pizza. It's just cheese and bread and cheese and bread and cheese and bread and cheese and crackers, you know, but it fills you up. It's not doing the things for you that your body needs and you feel it and you feel run down and the bickering and the fighting and the tiredness. No! I don't want to get off the couch kind of mentality. That's not true. It is true. <laughs> it kills me. Food obviously is at the heart, the gut of things we do every day. And and I think the, the way in which we eat ultimately is a reflection of the culture and reflection of other ways that we behave. We have a sort of social obligation to feel like healthy food is a human right. open it up and think more broadly about when you think about the, the most vulnerable in society, how do we 
take it on ourselves as part of our responsibility as a company that wants to do well and produce good products, like how do we meet them? How do we how do we give them these delicious and healthy products? Consumers today they're increasingly wanting to cut peel back the layers on what is the magic of this brand? Like what's the story behind it? So I do think that's the the next piece is having something that's gonna engage a consumer emotionally. Once you get that demand going, hopefully you, know, you get the accessibility, your prices are gonna come down and then it becomes available to everybody who has that need. I think getting some perspective on scale and impact and how we can go really start to listen in those communities, really start to understand what the challenges are, what the perceived hesitation is, and figure out some of the ways to really start with the consumer in terms of understanding what those challenges are so we can innovate from that place. It's the scale, the muscle of a big food company to take these little brands and help bring it to everybody. So if they can leverage that skill set against a brand that you know, has all that goodness there. It's pretty much unstoppable. It's exciting because everyone's figuring out, okay, what do we want in the future? It's not a, just about growing a food movement. It's actually ensuring that we, as the food industry, are going to hold ourselves accountable on what happens to the planet, what happens to the health of the population, and that we, we are truly responsible for that. So that people could actually get it on all levels and all spectrums of income, that's a service. Let's all be healthy. Let's all live in a happy place, not just the people who can afford it. Millennials like to eat healthy too. We like convenient, we like, you know, to eat healthy. Oh my coconut sugar, come on guys, come on down. <laughs> come to the, the light side. Get the products in more places at a more reasonable price and kind of like feel the dreams. If you build it, they will come. So we had asked um, Kim Fox Johnson, who is one of my dear friends, and also Ashley Alsup, her business partner and another dear friend, if they could help us bring the people behind the food access question into Escabona, how can we understand them better? And this was the film they created, and I would like to bring them to the stage to talk about their takeaways from this work and what they learned and what we can we can move forward with as we address food access. So Kim and Ashley. Thank you, Carla. Good morning. So as a documentary filmmaker, I'm not usually the one up on stage. I'm usually let my voice be heard by them. But when Carlotta asked us to bring these people's lives to Escabona, we were thrilled with the opportunity. We really want to be part of this conversation that we're all having here at Escabona, because it's you guys were the ones who are really going to start this movement and really make it happen. Before I turn over the mic to Ashley, who will explain more about what we learned in the, in the film, I just wanted to share, in making the film, I just wanted to share a few things that I have learned through the many years, of, not many, but a few, being a filmmaker. <laughs> um, that I think that you could all hopefully think about too. But number one is just assume nothing. I mean, we walked into this single Latina mom's home and by asking her just a few questions and giving her a voice, she was able to share like, coconut sugar, come on down. I mean, who would think that that would come out of our conversation that day? Secondly, you're not really learning anything when you're the one talking. That's why I love being the one asking the questions. And thirdly, don't be afraid to ask the really hard questions. It's a missed opportunity, but also the people you're interviewing or talking with really, really want to have a voice. We were talking to Brandy in her car about why she got a KFC instead of a Sprouts, which she really wanted, and we had a real conversation. And by doing that, you really help them be part of the conversation and have a voice and empower them to really ask for new things and realize that they do have a say in this all. So I'll now introduce you to Ashley, who will um, share a little bit more about the people we met, but I really look forward to meeting you and having and learning what your questions are. Great. 
Um, yeah, so we made this film as a starting point for the conference. I think because anytime you start from a place of empathy, I think it unleashes a lot of creativity. And a lot of times uh, we think about what we can make or what we can produce or you know what we would like to see out in the world. And that's also a great starting point. Um, but we wanted to look at, the, at the, wor the food world through others' eyes, and we learned some really interesting things. So we spoke to six individuals, and you saw them in the film. Um, and while they are individuals, they are also kind of archetypes as well. So Stephanie, um, who's quite funny, she's, um, she's quite skeptical of the natural food world. She's someone who's not comfortable in Whole Foods, not because she doesn't have the money, but because she feels a bit bullied by um, the kind of Gwyneth Paltrow image <laughs> of the natural food world. She sees it as an assault on her Southern heritage and culture, that she's being told that she's bad and wrong and that she has to change and that she has to give up the food that she really loves and that her family really loves. And to her, this is all really trendy and she hopes it will blow over. At the same time, her doctor's telling her, like, you need to eat differently. Um, Diane, uh, we would call probably our nostalgia seeker in that she was someone who also grew up with really strong food traditions and remembered a time when her family all sat around the table and ate together, um, brought together by her mother's cooking. And she really yearns for that, that time. And that's something that Kim and I hear out in the field all the time, <sighs> is yearning for that connection with food. And a lot of times when people do have these kind of cravings, what they're really craving is not just that taste, but that emotional nutrition of that original experience, that time that we ate this together, even though now they may be eating it standing up by themselves. Um, and so she, she yearns for that and she yearns to connect with other people when she goes out to eat. And then we have Mark, who is probably a, a self-described food addict um, in the sense that he's really driven by his cravings and um, he's free to kind of pursue them at will. So whatever he kind of feels like eating, that's what, what he eats. Um, and he would describe himself as hooked on these cravings. Um, and he's had this health scare recently because um, type 2 diabetes runs in his family and he's starting to develop it. So he's someone who desperately wants help to change, um, doesn't have confidence in his ability to change, um, but is someone who's starting to lean into that change. Um, and then fourth, you know, we talked to Brandy and, you know, we thought of her as kind of a gauntlet runner. So we have a lot of people in our culture who aspire to eat healthily. Um, they uh, follow a lot of influencers on Instagram. They try different diets. They buy um, different products for their kitchen that are supposed to help them cook nutritious food um, you know, in an easier manner. Um, but the reality is she's surrounded by junk food all day. So even at her work, people are bringing in donuts, they're bringing in candy and soda, and there's free food around all the time. She works at a hotel. Um, and then on her way home, she goes to pick up her daughter and she drives down, Kim and I drove down this street to get to her house. It's just fast food everywhere. And there are no other options. And so, you know, for someone like her, the, the effort she has to make simply to get the food that um, would be right for her is a lot. And it's especially hard to do that when you have these other foods surrounding you all the time. And then we have Julie, who we'd call our distressed believer. She is someone whose heart and soul is in the natural food movement. Um, but because of some economic um, circumstances in her life, she can't afford it anymore. And she's really pissed. <laughs> she's really, really angry about it. Um, and I think, you know, she's, um, and she and many out there like her are a huge opportunity for us if we can get the right products to, to her at the right price because she has the access except for the money. And then finally, um, with Joven, we call her our natural advocate. And um, she's someone who, even though she's on a budget, has figured out how to make it happen. And she's a real cheerleader for the natural food industry and for getting her own sort of family on board. Um, and so 
Individually, these are just six people on the outside of the natural food world looking in, but their perspective can be really valuable to us because collectively they can, they can help us start to ask some really important questions. So with Stephanie, um, there's so many culture wars going on in our country right now. Let's not make food another one of them, even though we know it is. Um, but how can we avoid triggering those kind of tribal allegiances, the sense of judgment that she's talking about, the you know, high school mean girls? Um, and I think just this fundamental fear that people have of things being taken away. Um, she doesn't see it as the addition of wonderful, fresh, delicious, nourishing food to her life. She sees it as her food being taken away. And I think we have to get inside that mindset to get past that. Um, with Diane, like how can we work within food traditions, even regional food traditions, to deliver fresh, healthy food? You know, most people are not gonna go from eating fast food to eating a, a quinoa kale bowl with chia seeds in one day, right? There's gonna be a lot of steps on that journey. And we need more kind of gateway products that help people to take that first step to say, hmm, this is familiar enough, but it's still tasty and it is better for me. And so that makes me feel like this could be a worthwhile journey. I don't have that sense of things being taken away from me. Um, and I think also with, with Diane, Kim and I were thinking like, is there a way either you know, through restaurants or events that we can make our food not just a product that an individual consumes, but something that is social? How can we create that kind of shared experience within our brands um, that give people that connectivity that they're craving? With markets, how can we make fresh, healthy food not just delicious, which we all know is necessary, but to be as seductive um, and appealing as fast food, and that's a tall order. Um, and how can we help someone like him get, get going on his journey? With Brandy, it's how can we bring fresh, healthy food to more underserved areas and demographics? You know, the reason all of those restaurants are in you know, her neighborhood is because they just look at a set of demographics and they open a place up. Um, but when we don't just go for the usual suspects, we can really expand the net of who we're talking to. And how can we be a source of motivation and inspiration? Because we preach to the already converted, we don't always know what we need to say to help those who are really trying to change. So how can we be as effective as the diet industry or the exercise industry at getting people to understand what is healthy and what the steps for them are? And then, you know, the big one, how can we bring down the price on fresh, healthy food? And I think we'll do that when we get to the scale that we need to get to. But maybe we need to be looking at smaller sizes or different packaging that can just get that price down to be accessible for the people who want it. And then finally with Joven, it's, you know, we've got natural advocates, um, you know, in our natural food world, and how can we empower them to be more influential in their families and communities? Because it means a hell of a lot more when someone that you trust who's inside your group is advocating for something than when it feels like it's kind of, a, a, you know, an elite living in New York um, or a movie star. And so, you know, not just advocating for our products, but advocating for the industry as a whole. Um, and so, you know, really like what this film is about in the end is uh, looking at the world through others' eyes and maybe as we discuss ideas throughout this conference, think about these people, get them under your skin and, and think about like how they would react to the stuff that we're saying. Um, because when we look beyond the usual suspects, we can really introduce a new kind of virtuous cycle. Um, and it may be that we create products for them. Um, but it could be also that we take collective action, that these are things that our companies can do even if our products aren't doing them. So finally, just to end on a shape, because you always have to have a shape, um, <laughs> and this grossly oversimplifies it, but imagine a world in which we got a kind of virtuous circle going of empowering advocates from within, um, leveraging gateway products, um, having really smart products that help people begin that journey, um, motivating, inspiring, informing, supporting, thinking about other industries that do this really well, deepening and extending their health journeys and getting them to go further. So you liked that, now you can try this. Um, the supply and cost at scale, getting it out to everybody, and this feeding uh, a new cycle that gets people into a much healthier way of eating and expands the range of the natural food industry.
Thank you, Ashley and Kim. Those questions are awesome and the personas are wonderful. Um, thanks for, for the work and, and sharing that with everyone. Eric Pierce is gonna come up and we're gonna talk about labeling and, and its impact on food waste with expiration dates. Um, he's gonna share some research and then he's also gonna have, have a small panel. Eric, come on up. Fabulous. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Ashley. Um, the work you, get is, you guys did was really powerful and important. Um, one of the key things we wanted to do with Escobona t today was to, to really shine a light, uh, to bring empathy, if you will, to the food insecurity issue, to the hunger issue that we face in this country. Improving food access is a critical issue for, for our industry, right? Building empathy and finding ways to serve those that are outside of our core community is really essential, selfishly, to our growth as an industry, but more importantly, to serving who we are, who we are as an industry, right? To serving our goals of bringing more health to more people, building healthier businesses, and supporting a healthy planet in the process. As you've heard several times today, reinforcing themes for Escobona today really do involve bringing affordable access to healthy food to the masses, humanizing the food access, pro pro uh, food access problems and shining a light on food insecurity, bringing equality in the food system by engaging big and small alike through across the food system and using technology and innovation and influencers to activate and build demand in the marketplace. These goals intersect with our Feeding the Good Food Future program. We believe that the future of food is in our hands and that tomorrow really can be a better place if we join forces, but there's a lot of work to be done. This year, we've once again partnered with passionate food suppliers and food brands to help develop real solutions in the world. Through this program, we are tackling issues like we're discussing today, right? We're thinking creatively and we're looking to address how food waste and misunderstandings around expiration dates on the products that we manufacture and sell is just one way in which we can help improve food access. The Feeding the, Good Food Pro, Pro, uh, Feeding the Good Food Future program also looks at important issues like supply chain traceability, supply, uh, sustainable businesses, healthy innovation, and retailing initiatives. So I just want to say really quickly, thank you to our sponsors in this program who have helped us in pursuing solutions for a healthier tomorrow, but have also helped bring the research we're about to share with you to Escobona this year. Our Escobona event and our events are about more than just connecting Right? It's about more than just thought leaders, influencers, and disruptors. It's about more than just ideas and discussion. We want to design these, these sessions to drive collaboration and action. We'll encourage you today to use your time here today to think about the kinds of actions that you can use to support your business, to grow your business, to improve food access, if you will, when you leave the show tomorrow. We wanted to focus our efforts today by leading by example, right? So we talk about action and that's really important to us. Last year at our Escobona event, we identified through our collaborative work together, the importance of expiration dates and the role that they play in bringing in, in food access and food insecurity, right? New Hope and our sponsors identified a research effort that we wanted to use to drive further discussion, inspiration and hopefully action that we can take as businesses in this industry, right? We wanted to identify consumer, retailer, manufacturer, as well as food bank pantry managers' understanding of food expiration date labels. Because again, we saw that there's an important connection between this and the food access issues that we're talking about. We wanted to use this research then to inspire how we think about, how the industry thinks about food waste and its connection to food insecurity. And waste is a difficult word. When we start talking about connection, connecting the idea of food waste to food insecurity and feeding the hungry, I want to identify real quickly the fact that when we talk about waste, that's an action. That's not a product, right? We're not talking about giving waste to people in need. We're talking about being wasteful in our actions. And we don't really think about the role that expiration dates play in the wastefulness that we contribute. But we need to start thinking about food and the value that some of this food has and figuring out how to get it to those who are in need. So in order to drive this conversation, we set out to do some research. We wanted to build upon a foundation of existing research. So we identified research that was done by Harvard and Johns Hopkins University in 2016 among consumers and their understanding 
of expiration dates. We wanted to build upon that then. We wanted to drive the conversation deeper into industry by looking at natural and organic retailers, natural and organic food and beverage manufacturers, our industry, right, as well as food bank pantry managers to better understand their understanding of this particular issue. So in the pages ahead, when I talk about consumer research, I'm gonna be referencing the Harvard and Johns Hopkins work. When I talk about industry, retailers, manufacturers, and the pantry managers, I'm gonna be talking about the research we did. I will sometimes refer to them collectively as the industry. Um, when I do that, I'm just basically talking about the average perception across that space. So food waste is a huge issue. It's a global issue, right? It is one of the biggest issues that we need to solve for as we work to feed a growing population with fewer resources while facing the challenges of climate change. But food waste is also an incredibly local, an incredibly domestic issue, right? In this country, right, we have such privilege, right? We are one of the biggest countries in the world. We are one of the few super superpowers. We are a leader in economic development and one of the most prosperous countries in the world. Yet at the same time, Carlotta mentioned some of these stats, right? The U.S., according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Research Services, one in 10 of us is considered food insecure. One in 10 of us is hungry and unsure how we're gonna find our next meal. One in seven, that's 15% of the U.S. population, relies on food banks at least once a year to feed themselves or their family. So while food waste is a major issue at a global level and one of pressing importance, we're going to talk today about focusing on food waste and the role that ex expiration dates can have on improving food access. The results from our research, just to kind of paint a picture before we get into it, the results of our research are going to show you that food waste does have a significant impact or expiration dates have a significant impact on food security. The confusion around expiration dates and legal liability as well as concerns about brand image have a major impact on us pre on preventing us from getting valuable nutrients to those who need it in this country and that brands and retailers will show you really need to play a role in helping to solve this problem as we've already discussed food waste is a major issue here's the size of it right estimates from Johns Hopkins and others suggest that 40 percent of the US food supply that's almost half of everything we grow and produce is wasted on an annual basis Johns Hopkins estimated that that represents $218 billion of wasted food each year. The USDA estimates a little bit further, they take their estimate and refine that. Three quarters of that wasted food, they say, is wasted or lost at the retail or at the consumer level. The USDA states themselves that one major source of food waste is emerges from consumer and retailer confusion about expiration dates, confusion about the wholesomeness or the fitness for consumption of food because of food waste. It's important to recognize that when we talk about expiration dates, it's important to recognize that the USDA, the FDA do not require the use of these dates. There is no law requiring that we put these late dates on there. There is no law preventing us from selling food that is near or past its expiration date. We have an obligation, of course, to sell food that is fit for human consumption and that is wholesome but the use of expiration dates predominantly is to protect our brands. It is to protect our brand image. It is not required by law. And there's a lot of healthy food out there that is being dated and treated as waste simply because of how we choose to manage our brand equity. So right, despite this, right, despite all of this waste, we see inconsistent understanding and use of expiration dates as causing confusion, uncertainty, and unnecessary waste. There are too many labels Right? There are too many labels out there, they are being misinterpreted, and they are suggesting safety inappropriately when in reality it's quality that we're signaling to the marketplace. It causes confusion as well with regards to legal liability, and all of this is leading to waste. Case in point, looking at the Johns Hopkins research here, right? Date labels cause confusion among U.S. consumers, right? They revealed here in their survey that 37% of consumers usually or always throw away food that is close to or past the date on the package. Remember, there's no legal obligation to put that date on there. In most cases, we're protecting brand image as opposed to suggesting anything about quality and safety. Right? The people at the USDA suggest to us that our sense of smell and our sense of sight are still our best indicators of whether or not something is fit for human consumption, not an expiration date. This data suggests to me that 37% of consumers are using date labels as a clear indicator of safety 
whether or not that food is fit for consumption, not as an indicator of quality, not as a way of helping us brand, manage our brands. And when I talk about brand image, I'm talking about color, safe, uh, sorry, color, texture, and um, taste issues, right? It means that food is being wasted. So let's shift the perspective a little bit to the industry, right? When we think about food waste, a lot of us put a lot of focus on consumers and what consumers are throwing away. Right, a lot of us put our effort on educating consumers. And I think that's important, but I also want to stress today that as an industry that is using these date labels to decide what we toss, what we keep, what we sell, or how we manage our brand, that we as an industry must take responsibility for understanding our legal liability, for understanding what these dates mean, for understanding the implications of putting these dates on our products. We can help and we need to help, and we can solve a huge bit of this food waste issue and ensure that we can feed hungry consumers in the US by simply solving this expiration date issue. Opportunity exists in the industry to donate more. In our survey among retailers, manufacturers, and food pantry managers, we saw that on average 60% of food that is at or past date is being thrown away. It's not being donated for human consumption. It's being given to animals, it's going into compost, or it's going into the trash. So when 12% Right, one in, one in 10, 12% roughly, uh, or actually I think 12% is the actual number. Um, when 12% of consumers are food insecure, when they're hungry, when one in seven of us rely on food banks at some point in time during the year to feed ourselves or feed our family, we need to take pause and recognize that it's not just consumers that are throwing food away, it's not just consumers that are driving this, but the date labels we're using are driving our own wasteful actions. We are throwing food away that is good. Most of this is still wholesome when it has passed its date. Even if it's a highly perishable product, most of this could be donated while it was still wholesome. So why aren't we donating more? Our industry research suggests that it's because of concerns about legal liability and brand image. Again, when I talk about brand image or quality issues here, I'm talking about taste, texture, and color issues, right? The things that we want to manage to ensure our customers have a good experience with our product. But at the same time, we're gonna see here is creating waste, right? So when we asked our industry to evaluate and to tell us how they use some of these date labels, we chose to ask people about the best by date. We asked people about the best by date because we thought it was one of the clearer date labels in use out there. One that indicated quality issues as opposed to safety issues, right? But what we saw is two thirds of retailers and manufacturers, nearly two thirds, it's that they were concerned about legal liability and that was impacting their decision to whether or not to donate or to throw food away. When we further asked them about other reasons why they're not donating food, they told us about brand management, right? About brand image, about brand image concerns. A third as well are expressing concern. In the context, I, I think this makes perfect sense as brands. We need to manage brands' expectations, right? But at the same time, when our concern about our brand image is impacting hunger in the United States, it's a little inflammatory, but I would almost say in some ways, our brand vanity is creating waste and leaving people hungry. We need to rethink about how we balance our concerns about managing brand equity and ensuring that we are not creating waste in a way that is preventing hungry people from getting the food that they could use. So how do we reduce food waste or the wasteful actions that create unused food, right? in association with expiration dates in a way to improve food access to feed hungry. First, we need to educate the consumers, right? So we already saw some, some data from Harvard and Johns Hopkins that suggested this sort of thing. When we show consumers a list of different food labels and ask them how they interpret them and how they use them, we see where some of this waste is coming from. We see the confusion and the need to educate. There are something like 70 different food date labels in use right now. Best buy, best if used by, freshest buy, expires on, expires by, sell by, the list goes on. There's no, no doubt that there's confusion out there and the data here suggests it. Just looking at a handful of the clearest quality oriented messages, we see nearly a third of all consumers being unclear, thinking that these are clear indications of safety, not of quality issues, right? So about a third of consumers are throwing food away or they're misinterpreting this and that's leading to that nearly 40%, 37% that we saw who are always throwing away food that was past its date. If we want to improve things, though, that we also need to educate the industry, right? 
This includes retailers, manufacturers, as well as food bank pantry managers, right? We saw earlier that 60% of this food that was near or past date was being thrown away as opposed to being donated. This may be in part because we too are confused. When we ask industry the same figures, we see the same figures that we saw with consumers. Again, these quality-oriented dates, about a third of us in the industry misunderstand these dates and believe that they too are indicators of safety, not of quality. Next, we see that we need to educate the industry about legal liability and the protections that are afforded to us under the Good Samaritan Act, right? We saw one of the major reasons why people were unsure about whether or not they should donate being legal concerns. We need to understand that in October of 1996, President Clinton signed into law the Good Samaritan Food Donation Act, right? This is an act that is designed to encourage donation of food products to nonprofit organizations for distribution to individuals in need. This law protects donor and recipient against liability, except in cases of gross negligence or intentional misconduct. Each state additionally has passed their, passed their own Good Samaritan Acts that provide further legal liability to good faith donors. Unfortunately, 1996, right? It feels like yesterday, but that was 21 years ago. 21 years ago, right? 21 years has passed and we are still unaware of this law. We are still unsure of how to use it to protect us and our efforts to do good in the industry, right? On average, about 70%, we look here in our survey, 70% of our industry believes that liability, legal liability and risk is what is preventing them in some ways from donating food, right? This misunderstanding is contributing to waste and more importantly, missed opportunities. Finally, we see that we need to work to standardize our date labels, right? There are a lot of investors in the room, there's a lot of manufacturers in the room. We have control, we can influence how we use these labels, we need to find clarity for ourselves, right? We need to work to standardize these. We need to evaluate potential solutions for waste, uh, reducing waste and increasing access, right? Our survey here, when we asked the industry what kinds of things might help, there was almost unanimous agreement that having standardized labels would help. The good news is that there's already some, some momentum building behind this. The Food Marketing Institute and Groceries Manufacturer Association are currently working to try and standardize these labels. They're lobbying the current membership to adopt just the use of two labels, a quality label and a safety label. The quality label that they're proposing is best if used by, and their safety label is used by. Please consider adopting or supporting these efforts as we work to reevaluate how we use labels in our businesses, but also how we can reduce waste and feed more hungry. All of us can contribute to this, right? Whether you're a retailer or a manufacturer, whether you're an investor, we all have some form of influence in these issues. I'd ask you to consider taking action. I'd ask you to look at some of these fairly functional things. I know reprinting packaging is not easy, but some of the simple, relatively simple things that we can do to help improve and to solve these issues, right? Here are suggested actions. All of us, I think, we need to understand our legal liability. Take the time to understand the Good Samaritan Act and think about what your liability actually is. Work to create clarity, to seek clarity in quality and safety issues. And again, let's be cautious about brand vanity versus brand equity and brand image, right? Let's ensure that our intent of managing our brands and protecting our images with regards to quality is not getting in the way of us feeding people who need this food. From a manufacturer standpoint, understand the difference between safety and quality. Be mindful of what labels you use. Be supportive of efforts to standardize and reduce confusion of these labels. Take the time and effort, if you can, to educate yourself as well as others in your supply chain and your retailer network or your distribution network to better understand what these labels mean and what they should do. Think about how you can work directly to ensure that your product, when it reaches date or is past date, gets donated appropriately. There are organizations out there that can help you with this. We're gonna have some of them up on our panel today to talk about creative solutions to take this further. But I'd also suggest one that was often recommended to me was the Feeding America Network. Other agencies like this can help you manage quality and safety issues and concerns in donating your product to the market. So I just want to say thank you again to our sponsors. Thank you to each of you for engaging, engaging your creative problem solving in thinking about this. And thank you to our New Hope and Escabona, Escabona for making this a topic that we were going to address again this year and to our sponsors for supporting this research. Thank you.
So we're going to use this as a platform in some ways for continuing the conversation. I'm going to transition a little bit to talk about creative solutions. We have a panel of experts and, and uh, creative problem solvers that are going to help us think a little bit about what we can do going beyond some of these functional things, right? We want to encourage you to think about this issue uh, of food waste and food access um, with across your supply chain, across your manufacturing process, because we think there really are some creative opportunities. A lot of us might look at this expiration date stuff and say, okay, there's things I can do there. But we'd also want to encourage you to look deep into the process that you're using to create your products and to source your products, because we'll see in a minute as we discuss with our panel that there are opportunities to look deeper and to go further. So with that, I'd like to invite to the stage our panel of experts, Judith Ackerman, is business development and marketing officer at Metro Caring, an organization designed to create uh, job training as well as uh, to address food security issues in the Denver and Boulder area, sorry, the Denver area. Um, Shireen Chow, nutrition consultant from LA Kitchen, doing similar work in the LA area. And Dan Kurzrock, co-founder uh, and chief grain officer of Regrain, uh, 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 food manufacturing, doing really creative and interesting things with food waste uh, in his business. So thank you guys. All right, um, I'm going to take a breath. <laughs> Sorry for going so fast, but we've got a lot of exciting stuff to talk about. Um, so welcome. Thank you for being part of this conversation, guys. Um, as I had mentioned, I really want us to, to encourage the audience to think creatively about where opportunity may exist to solve food insecurity issues um, within their businesses and how we can use for-profit um, and not-for-profit organizations to, to make some of these connections. And, and I think each one of you is, is here today in part because of the creativity that your organizations you know, have shown in solving some of these problems. Uh, in order to help the audience get to know each of you a little bit better, could you each take a, just a couple of minutes to tell us about yourself and the organization and some of the things that you're most proud of doing? Yeah? Go ahead, Judith. Oh, you want me to start? Sure. Morning, everyone. I'm Judith Ackerman. As Eric mentioned, I work at Metro Caring. Um, we're a Denver-based nonprofit that's addressing um, hunger and poverty in the metro area. Um, a little bit ba of background on myself. I'm a native New Yorker, recent transplant to Denver, decided um, to change geography and change careers simultaneously. Not sure if I would recommend that. Um, but um, I love food, as I'm sure everyone in the room does. And I decided through my career shift to take that passion for food and um, make it my full-time job to help make sure that everyone has access to good food. So I started volunteering last summer at Metro Caring and was really blown away by the holistic approach to food access and um, hunger overall that the organization was doing. So between our fresh foods market, which is completely free and stocked with nutritious and healthy food, and wraparound programming where we're offering education and skills to allow people to get back on their feet and really reach their potential. Um, so whether it's through our nutrition education programs or financial literacy classes and other programming, um, our goal is to improve the overall wellness of our community. And in my role, I have the best job of working and collaborating with businesses to engage them in being part of the solution. Fabulous. Thank you. Shereen? Hi. Good morning. Um, so very similar to Judith. Uh, I'm actually based in Los Angeles. And my first career, actually, I was in tech, uh, working at Hewlett Packard. And I actually wanted to go back to my first love, which has always been food. And so uh, as a kid, I always wanted to go to culinary school. And I really wanted to engage in that aspect. And so I actually moved to New York to go to culinary school. And uh, as I learned more about nutrition and food and how it heals our body, I wanted to learn more about the science piece. And so I went back to school to become a dietitian. And combining those things, um, LA Kitchen was a great place for me to give back to my community and also focus on uh, those strengths. And so LA Kitchen, uh, it's a nonprofit focused on culinary um, engagement. So we have a culinary program, job training program for people who are actually coming out of prison, former foster youth and formerly homeless individuals. And we give them a second chance to really learn a new skill and be able to be employed in various um, culinary fields. 
And we also have an impact program where we work with a lot of different food companies and they actually donate their produce or products to us and we work with a lot of volunteers to create healthy meals for low-income seniors throughout Los Angeles. Most seniors, um, if they're low income, most seniors are, don't have savings, and the last thing they're focused on is really providing nutrition for themselves after housing and after healthcare. And so um, these seniors typically are, you know, utilizing Meals on Wheels or you going to senior centers for, for meals. And most of these meals, actually all of them are Monday through Friday only for lunch. And so when you think about that, you know, we eat three times a day at least and then obviously seven days a week. So um, all these meals go out to seniors who really, really need the food and uh, it's just in addition to the food banks that they might not be being able to get to. Yeah. Both of these organizations, you know, were chosen because of a lot of the uh, incredible work that they do, but also because they're tackling um, food insecurity from a very holistic perspective, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Dan, um, tell us a little bit, so, so our for-profit sort of representative on stage today, uh, you know, master of creative solutions as far as I'm concerned in this area, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and, uh, and your business. Sure. Thanks, Eric. Good morning, everybody. Yes, yeah, so I'm here representing the brand side of things. I founded a company called Regrained. Uh, we are closing the loop between the brewing industry and the food system, more broadly trying to create a more circular economy for food. Um, I, I really stumbled into the natural foods industry and into the food waste world as a 19-year-old in college that just learned how to make beer, which my mother was thrilled about. <laughs> and I was just blown away by the process. I, I loved it. I loved making this, this beverage, which, of course, I never drank. That would have been illegal. Um, <laughs> but the, the process was great, and what I discovered was that by brewing beer, I was actually creating food, and then you just kind of throw out the food part of it. And what I mean by that is it takes a lot of grain to make beer. It's about a pound of grain for every six pack, and you extract the sugars from the, from the grain to make the beer. But you're left with the solid grain, which still has all the protein and the fiber. And so an idea struck that I could create bread with that. You know, after doing some research online, if I sold enough loaves of bread, I might just be able to brew beer for free, um, which might make my mother a little happier because it'd be easier on the budget. Um, as, as we started to get into it, that we realized that there's this huge opportunity to, to close this loop at scale. The, the beer industry is, is seeing a, a lot of growth. We've got more than two new breweries opening per day. A lot of them opening up in cities, and it's kind of the shifting ecosystem. And so that's kind of where, where, we, uh, where we plug in. But for, for me, what I'm really, really focused on is this idea of, of edible upcycling. It's not a super new idea, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's the, the concept of looking at kind of the, maybe the end of a supply chain or an edible byproduct and finding the highest possible use, which is feeding, which is about feeding people. Um, and there's a lot of really creative ways that that's, that's happening in the industry, which I'll, I'll get into more later, but I'm just thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. I think that idea is an exciting one because I would imagine in those estimates of 40% that they're not considering edible upcycling as part of the waste that's there. So again, when yeah. we think about feeding a growing population or feeding those that are undernourished or, or hungry within our country, you know, that's an that's a untapped or unmeasured opportunity space, I think, as it is. Untapped right is a good choice of words. <laughs> Uh, was it tapped? No, you said it wasn't. <laughs> it is a good choice of words. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Shireen, um, so again, we're all here because of some of the creative solutions that we had. You know, in, in one of our prior conversations, you said something uh, really powerful that I thought uh, was important to connect our audience to as, as we look for creative solutions within our business. You, you had said to us um, that there, there's really no good reason that any of this should be thrown away when we were talking about food. Um, and we were thinking about businesses and, and the, again, I call it waste. It's not necessarily waste if we don't waste it. Um, but when we think about the food and the nutrition that's available in our process, tell us a little bit about this idea that really none of it should, should be wasted uh, to get us thinking creatively. Yeah, so our mission at LA Kitchen is neither food nor people should ever go to waste. And we try to embody that through our holistic practices. And so with the food donations that we get, um, most of that comes from actually farm, like Imperfect Produce is one of our biggest partners and they donate about 80% of the food that we receive. Uh, we work with a lot of different farmers and um, they're basically a CSA for Imperfect products. 
on the farm. And they're able to donate to us. And with this, um, working with different volunteers is really helpful in the sense of um, being able to create these meals and creating healthy standards that aren't typical to what f typical food donations are. When you think about donating food, you're thinking about um, throwing away, you know, maybe foods that you don't want already. But, you know, would you serve that to your grandmother? Would you serve that to other people in your community? And so thinking about these solutions maybe in your supply chain of where you might have excess. Um, for example, we did this project earlier this year called Feedback, uh, Feeding 5,000, where we fed 5,000 people with all reclaimed food, so food that would have been wasted. And so we actually, you know, when we're juicing kale, because green juice is all the rage everywhere, so juicing kale, we are able to create juice, but we also use the pulp, and we made, um, kale quesadillas with corn masa, and we were able to make these into corn kale tortillas and feed 5,000 people with that. That's incredible. The, the story there is several layers deep, right? If you started with the ugly produce, if you will, that, that otherwise was going to be waste, that you know, then is going out to distributing to others, but then you're, you're, you're saving waste from your own process. I mean, we're, we're layers yep. deep now. I mean, think about the opportunities um, in this. this. That's really incredible. Are, are there other stories, you know, um, that you think might inspire others that, of, of creative solutions like that, um, that, that we can tell others of, of where you've found waste in somebody's process? Um. So um, some of these processes, uh, for example, um, some of the foods that farmers might be throwing away, that, that type of thing. Um, let's see. Another big one is when people donate to companies might be donating to other nonprofit organizations that don't have large kitchens. So we've also partnered with other nonprofits that might get bigger donations. For example, Union Rescue Mission, which is a really big mission in Los Angeles. And they aren't able to get the type of volunteers and um, the kitchen production that we're able to. And because we have a culinary job training program, we're able to not only train the students, but also utilize the food that Union Mission might not be able to process, create meals, and then donate it back to all the people at the mission. Right, yeah, so teaching people how to use the food exactly. as well is, is really important. That's great. Dan, um, in, I'm, I'm gonna overuse the word creative. I should have done a thesaurus search here before I got on the stage to, to use it up for other it. words, but I really do want us thinking you know, about unique opportunities and solutions within our business. We, you talked about edible upcycling, and you and I spoke a bit about that. Um, whether it's something that you're doing with Regrained or not, I'd love to stimulate thinking within the audience about some of the places where some of this edible upcycling, you know, opportunity exists. What do you think are some of the more creative or interesting things you've seen out there? Totally, yeah. So there's there's two main areas that I think as a, as a manufacturer, at least, that you can that you can look. One is in your sourcing. Um, so like some of the things that Shereen are talking about, looking at, and this is, again, it's an old idea that you know, they used to be, we call it imperfect produce today, it used to be called canning grade produce, right? <laughs> um, and looking at bringing in ingredients into your supply chain that make an impact um, beyond just the you know, sheer, sheer nature of the ingredient itself. An example of that, so we're, we're upcycling this grain from beer production. We also use an ingredient called coffee flour, which is made from the cherry that is left behind from, from coffee production, right? And it's actually has a lot of antioxidants, it has caffeine, um, but it typically just you know, rots at the farm. And there's a lot of ingredients uh, like that out there. Whey is one that people often don't think of as a waste or byproduct ingredient, which of course comes from, from cheese making. So looking at your sourcing and what you're bringing into your, you know, your facility and then using that as an opportunity to be able to also tell a story about how you are um, keeping, closing the nutrient loop and keeping nutrition within the food system. Another area is around your own manufacturing lines and getting really creative. I know that uh, Canagra actually with their with their pudding lines, you know, switching over, they they created a blended flavor that they brought to market so that they mm. didn't have to th toss out, you know, massive amounts of not that pudding's the most nutritious uh, food out there, but I love that they're they're and it makes business sense too. It's not just about the altruistic, you know, uh, concept of of closing this loop. Another one, example, again, not a super healthy product, but Slim Jim, they started bagging their, their ends and pieces and selling that as a product in itself. So looking creatively at 
your own process and what's left behind and finding ways to reuse that. And I think the really exciting opportunity is, is how you tell that story. I think a company that's doing a really great job is, uh, they're out of San Francisco, they're called Forager Project. They uh, started as a, as a juice company. Um, they had left over from their juicing process uh, fruit and vegetable pulps, and they actually created a line of chips with pressed vegetables and pressed fruits. And those chips are incredibly popular, so popular that I haven't con confirmed this yet, um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that they are now at the point where they are source, they're sourcing pulp also from other juiceries uh, mm -hmm. and closing, closing that loop in an even more meaningful way because they're making a really great product that's healthy and it also happens to be really sustainable, closing that loop. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to look really creatively um, at creating these products and also how you're, how you're telling that story because consumers care. All right. Yeah, so from a brand side, there's, there's powerful opportunity to actually create new business and revenue streams from, from these products. You know, I, I think about, and I, again, I, I, the intent here is to really encourage you guys to think about your own supply chain, your own manufacturing process, and ask questions. Like, go out there with fresh eyes, with this conversation in mind, to, to look at, or ask for help. We'll get to this idea in a second. Ask for help looking at your process to see where you can find opportunities. One of the stories I love is a company called Repurpose Pod that looked at the process of, of making um, cocoa. What they've actually discovered is that, like the coffee fruit story, there's this pulp around the cocoa pod that has just traditionally been thrown away. A bit of it is used in the fermentation process, but it's not all needed. They're actually in the process now of creating a sweetener line as well as a beverage product based on it's the really use of tasty that product. Too. Yeah, it is very good. So again, there's opportunities out there even if they don't feel obvious, and sometimes a fresh eye with a new problem or a problem in mind might help you identify that. That brings us right to, to, Judith, to Judith and what I wanted to have you talk to us, us about. You guys have proven in, incredibly resourceful in working with brands to find unique solutions. Tell us either some of your favorite stories or some of the ways in which you've worked with companies to find maybe the unobvious solution uh, that have helped solve some of the food security issues in the Denver area. Absolutely. There are so many stories that it's sometimes hard to pick just one or two, but I have two very different stories that I wanted to share. Um, the first starts with a woman named Carolyn who had to come to Metro Caring for food following a divorce. And she had two children and had a full-time job. And even though she was making a full-time salary, between all of her expenses, she was just having trouble making ends meet to put food on the table. So she came to us for a handful of months, was trying to get back on her feet. And when she was able to secure uh, a better paying job, she actually ended up working full time at a food distributor. And one of our truck drivers met Carolyn, um, making the rounds, picking up food. Um, and in his day-to-day -day conversations, he likes to find out why people donate to Metro Caring. And Mike found out about Carolyn's story. And she just felt that um, she's been there and she really wanted to pay it forward. So thinking about distributors as one part of the supply chain, um, in my interactions with various um, people there, I've noticed a lot of opportunities where if people just take a step back and think for a moment about their distribution. There are a lot of opportunities where um, we like to consider it our food rescue program, but where we can alleviate food waste. A couple of examples are um, when, when brands are manufacturing and then there's a rebrand. Um, a lot of changing of your labels, changing of your logo, changing of the name of a product um, can lead to a lot of excess inventory sitting around either at the distributor or, or wherever. Um, I've also met with some people where um, they have cases where there's one piece that's damaged and all of a sudden that entire case just sits there and ends up in a pile waiting for someone to handle it and people don't really know what to do with it. Um, I would have to say that in all of my interactions I haven't come across a scenario where we haven't found waste somewhere and a lot of brands um, pride themselves on being zero waste and, and yet there, there's always opportunity if people think about it. Um, my second example is um, really fascinating. Um, it was with an egg supplier who came to Metro Caring for a tour. And we really pride ourselves in providing very healthy, nutritious food. We really think that those who are struggling with food insecurity have access to fast food, junk food, um, at their fingertips every single day. And that's not the type of food that we want to be providing. And um, part of the way that we help with our sustainability is by donating sugary snacks, pastries to a pig rancher for feed. And so 
this egg supplier noticed that and put two and two together and realized that there's a lot of breakage in the egg industry, as can be expected, and that he was paying a premium to have tons, literally tons of liquid eggs removed from his um, plant um, on a daily basis. And eggs are very high in protein. Pigs love protein. Maybe if we can connect him with a pig rancher, he could stop paying to have this waste removed and have a pig rancher pick up the waste and use it for feed. So it's sustainable, and through that partnership, um, if he were able to reduce the expenses of having the waste removed, it would allow his budget to donate more eggs to Metro Caring. Yeah, that's, that's a powerful story. Um, and, and one that reinforces for me this important idea of, of the fresh eyes to the problem, right? So I think each one of us can look at it, uh, our own process with fresh eyes, but also I'd encourage you to, to look to organizations like those that we have here for help. If you feel like, no, there's no waste in our process, you know, um, ask for help because I think it's only that sort of solution that comes from taking the time to, to say we want to do something, we're just not sure how and asking for that kind of help. Um, it also brings us a little bit to this idea of motivation, right? Um, so you found a, a, an important way to motivate this particular egg, egg supplier or, or way to, to help him. When I was talking with some of the food pantry managers uh, about the results of our research, one thing that really came up was that there is a, a lack of motivation sometimes for businesses to engage, either because they're concerned about brand, brand image issues or the effort or the cost that they believe might go into putting processes in place to identify short-dated product and putting the effort into organizing and deliveries and drop-offs or whatever it might take, motivation to overcome some of those barriers is important. Um, to, to each of you, you know, let's talk a little bit about this idea of motivation. How can we help, if there is resistance for a brand or a retailer, how can we help them overcome that? And we'll go fairly quickly on this so that we can do a quick close as well. So maybe just a quick story or thought from each of you on, on motivation. Dan, can you start and we'll come down this way? Yeah, I'd love to. I think the, the, real, the thing that I always think of when it comes to, to motivating uh, you know, your company to, to take action on food waste is that food waste is it's, it's the ultimate win-win. We're not just talking about, and all three of these things are really important, so there's the environment, right? So we're talking about squandering resources that it took to, to grow the food at, you know, it's like three quarters of the size of California uh, in terms of agricultural land that is dedicated to, and not, you know, the equivalent that's dedicated to growing food that ends up being thrown out, right? So there's all these resources that go into it. There's also the social side of it. So we've got all this food waste and we've got all these people that are, that are hungry. That makes no sense. And then there's also the business case. There's the economics. Waste equals money, right? So closing this loop makes both uh, dollars and cents with, with an S, you know. <laughs> and it's something that uh, it, it's hard for me to think of reasons why you shouldn't care about food waste. So, yeah, great. Yeah, it's, it's hard for me to think of reasons why you shouldn't care about food waste either. Uh, but I think that it definitely needs to come from the top down. When we have companies who bring a whole group of volunteers, we've had different corporate partners come, um, Google, SpaceX, different companies coming to bring their volunteers, bring their employees in for a volunteer day, and really see what the food that they're working with, it's beautiful produce, and it makes the employees feel more engaged, more, reward, more rewarded in their work. And also, um, being able to serve your community and have that extra added layer of being community involved, community engagement, I think that's really big. And then if there's really, you know, even harder, like no other incentive, I think partnering with different groups that, you know, provide you with an incentive. So if you do need to have, for example, produce removed from your company or produce removed from your kitchen space. Uh, partner with organizations like ours. We have refrigerated trucks for that reason because we go to different organizations who, you know, want to throw, you know, want to donate but don't really want to donate um, or might not have the time or space. And so we make it a little bit easier by having refrigerated trucks to pick up all the produce that you might not want. Yeah, I think one of the important things, just to punctuate, um, we've talked about humanizing and putting a face on the, the food insecure as well. Getting people to engage, we, we all want to help. Sometimes the day-to-day -day slog of getting things done at work probably prevents us and makes it feel like the barrier is too much. But when we engage, when we volunteer, when we take the time to humanize the problem, you know, it's, it's so much easier to help and to see the opportunities. 
Judith. Shereen and I have so much in common. So what I'd like to add to that is that every person in this room today is here because we are connected to the food industry, but we're also very mission driven and everyone's business here has a purpose. And so part of Eric's research that was the most startling to me was about the concern about brand. And I think that many manufacturers, many distributors may not realize if they walked through the doors of Metro Caring or any food bank or food pantry, those brands are on the shelves. Likely they're ending up at the retailer and then there's potential spoilage and they're being donated. And it's wonderful that it's being donated, but if you're earlier in that supply chain and you're worried about your brand, your brand is about giving people healthy food. And you're thinking about what other markets can I break into? Why are certain families not purchasing my product? Well, they can't afford to. And so if you were to walk through the doors of Metro Caring and you saw your product there, would you be upset that your brand is on that shelf and that these families are having access to healthy food that they actually couldn't normally afford? I don't really think so. So I think we really need to break down any barrier that we might put in front of us about why we don't have waste. Why is the waste not ending up where it needs to be? Um, we talk about you know, the issues of food waste and the issue of food insecurity and how they're so interrelated. So I think if we all just think about ways that we can contribute to being part of the solution, that's all we can ask. Yeah. And I'd, I'd like to encourage each of you to think about that, right? That's, that has been the challenge for us in the, in the last hour is to get you thinking about in breaking down that barrier of, oh, there isn't waste or there isn't something that, you know, look at your business. We're all, we're all in this together. I think each and every one of us can contribute to this, either negatively through inaction or positively through the action that we can take following today. Um, any other quick, from each of you, closing thoughts, things you'd like to leave the audience with as, as we wrap up our panel discussion today? Yeah, I think I couldn't agree with Judith more, and I, I would go as far as to say that it's a brand liability to not see your food through to, to food banks and to donation channels, and that it is, frankly, you know, it's shameful if, if, that's, if that's the concern. Um, and consumers will find out, and, and they do care, and it's just, plain, plainly speaking, it's just the right thing to do. And I think the, the really important um, the thing that I want to leave everyone with is this is a super solvable problem, and we don't have to solve it alone. We can collaborate. You know, our, like my brand is looking to collaborate with other existing food companies and to plug our ingredient into their, you know, into their supply chains, just like we're looking to bring those into ours. There's massive opportunity for cross-sectoral collaboration um, with policymakers to make the right thing, you know, the easy thing for businesses, and it just it takes takes us giving a damn, and I think we all do, uh, and so let's just move from talking about it to, to taking action, and many of us are, and let's, let's solve this thing. Thank you. Totally agree. Um, I mean, and so many people go hungry every day. I work with so many people who are food insecure, and I think that, you know, being able to humanize the problem, seeing what that looks like, uh, there is really no reason to throw anything away. And, you know, working with different organizations to find creative solutions. I think even though we're a food organization, you know, some things you mentioned, you know, in terms of the rebranding and the packaging, even that, that's one of the most valuable donations that we can receive because we donate so many to so many homeless individuals. And so we have to individually buy these packages. And when we get the package donation, that's one of the you know best donations in addition to the food but one of the best donations we can get because you know homeless people aren't you know going to pick up food at a, they're going to pick up food at a place where they need it individually packaged they don't have a place to eat so this is something that's really helpful so this is one conversation that's part of a very complicated solution. Um, there isn't really just one path to take that's going to end hunger. And what I would really like to see, and I know LA Kitchen has a job training program, Metro Caring has our job training program called Seeds for Success, and we're looking for partnerships. Um, and that's what we really need to be doing is collaborating and making sure that people are being paid living wages um, not only within the food industry, but beyond. The families that we serve want to be able to afford their own food. They don't want charity. And while there are 
lots of populations that are struggling that may need long-term solutions through food banks. Um, really, the next conversation is about jobs and living wages. And for within the food industry, um, if you're able to hire someone who is part of an underserved population or collaborate with an organization like Metro Caring on our curriculum, you know best what's going on in the food industry, you know what the next big thing is, you know what those specialized positions are. So if we can see our candidates and our graduates going beyond cashiers or stockers um, into some of these more specialized positions that will procure a better um, salary for them. Um, we're looking for partnerships for people to help guide that curriculum to get people to help become more self-reliant and that will only improve our entire community. That's fabulous. Thank you to each of you for your leadership on this important issue. Thank you to our audience for, for engaging in this uh, topic and conversation and thanks again to our, our sponsors in Escabona. Thank you so much everyone. Uh, to stage right, over here, uh, look over and we see uh, Annie is hard at work, live illustrating our meeting today. Please feel free to engage her, take a photograph of the work that she's doing. It's quite beautiful as it takes shape. And we're going to invite our resident independent food educator back to the stage, Lauren Nixon, for another inspiring moment. again. I'm going to open up with a poem by uh, the Poet Laureate, uh, Tracy K. Smith. This is called The Good Life. When some people talk about money, they speak as if it were a mysterious lover who went out to buy milk and never came back. And it makes me nostalgic for the years I lived on coffee and bread, hungry all the time, walking to work on payday like a woman journeying for water without a well. Then one or two nights, living like everyone else on roast chicken and red wine. When I was little, I was a really big fan of the Ramona series. Does anybody remember that book? Ramona? <laughs> it was authored by uh, Beverly Cleary and it featured a really spunky female protagonist who had like a really like painfully blunt bob haircut and her hair was always all over the place, but she was always happy nonetheless. And uh, she was al always getting into sort of a, a bit of riffraff. It was harmless, innocent riffraff, but it was riffraff. Ramona went on different adventures as evidenced by the titles of her books. Ramona the Pest, Ramona the Brave, Ramona Quimby, age eight. I recall being a fan of both the book as well as the TV series because of course Disney had to do a spin-off of the book. And I remember in one episode Ramona's family deals with financial difficulties. They are trying to, quote, make ends meet. When I was really young, I never understood the phrase making ends meet. In my really little brain, I pictured actual meat. Like we're talking like ground beef and pork chops, like meeting, like pieces of meat touching, like a meat hug, which is very disgusting. It's a really gross thing. But that's, I was little and that's what I thought. I was hearing this phrase all around me on TV and in books and starting in like late elementary school all the way through high school in my own house. And so at some point it clicked, at some point it was not a meat hug, okay? Oh, I get it. This is what little Ramona Quimby was talking about when she was talking about making ends meet, right? Money is tight, resources are slim, there's not enough for all that we need. I remember being 20 years old, that was 10 years ago, I turned 30 in a couple days, living in New York and going to hop on a train with a friend. And after we both purchased passes, he turns to me and he says, after I purchase my card, I'm gonna have $20 left to my name. This is not an uncommon story. Do you think I can live off of $20 for two weeks, he asks me. Yes, absolutely, I tell him. And I told him this with confidence because I had done it before myself. Because although I cannot remember that particular memory in detail, I was more than likely living off of $20 that week too at age 20. And I would be in that situation on and off throughout my 20s. 
yes, absolutely, I told him that he could do it, but I didn't tell him about how, how painful it might be, how much it was gonna absolutely positively suck, about how his stomach might grumble and churn, how he might feel so frustrated and so angry at a situation that he might feel a fire burning in his core, about how he might look at someone eating a bowl of steaming hot vegetables in a stir fry sauce, something as simple and innocent as a stir fry and feel his mouth water like a faucet. I didn't remind him that he would be eating rice and beans on the days that he wasn't skipping meals, that he might not want to get out of bed until the day that his paycheck hit his bank account. I told him that he could do it because I was probably doing it too. I told him he could do it because we both had no other option at that time. We live in a world where there is more than enough to go around, more than enough food to keep us all afloat, but so much of it is out of our reach for a myriad of reasons. Not enough money, too much waste, food policy issues, transportation is issues, housing, food deserts, gentrification, trauma, and on and on and on. It's clear that achieving the good life, as Tracy K. Smith dubs it, is a systemic issue. This poem was featured in her 2011 book, Life on Mars, which won the 2012 Pulitzer Prize. Her entire book imagines a sci-fi future in which utopia is a real thing. No wonder she speaks in a nostalgic way about being able to afford a roast chicken on payday only. She's speaking about a world that hasn't happened yet or at least not for everyone. Someone in this room has a wacky great aunt, let's call her Denise or Mabel or Shelby, those are all really nice names, who would save the bones from the meat that she had roasted the night before. Denise or Mabel or Shelby, choose one of the names, would then simmer the bones for hours on end to produce a really rich, flavorful broth that went into her meals all throughout the week or throughout the month if she froze that broth. When you were little, you turned your nose up at your aunt. You thought she was wacky. You thought her to be eccentric. She was kind of thrifty to the point of embarrassment. Until the day you got sick. And that broth, it brought you back to life. And your wacky great aunt with a penchant for shift dresses and moo-moos became your healer. She was your elementary school guru. Someone in this room or middle or high school might have been told that, her, that their home packed lunch remnants of last night's dinner that was flecked with bits and bobs from the fridge was stinky. It reeked, it was repulsive, it was putrefying. And in turn, you had cooties, or perhaps something even worse than the fabled cootie disease. Perhaps it was sardines or a sandwich with gamey meat that someone in your family proudly hunted and processed. Maybe it was fragrant kimchi or a hearty pasta or a rice seasoned with uh, coriander and cumin. Despite what the contents were, you were really embarrassed by your lunch and you ate it in solitude on the days that you didn't throw it away. Whoever took care of you was really proud of the meals that they made for you and they used their, their hard earned money, which wasn't enough to begin with, to prepare these meals for you. At this moment, a restaurant is filling a dumpster with food that could be consumed by hungry people. A farm is composting a truckload of vegetables that could be consumed by hungry people. A dad somewhere is throwing a crisper full of vegetables into the trash can because the family didn't get around to eating it. Someone within a 10 mile radius is stocking up on catered food at work meetings because despite the fact that they have a full time job, their paychecks still aren't allowing them to make ends meet. So they tuck into unsatisfying portobello mushroom sandwiches and, and really bland iceberg lettuce salads, things that they don't actually want, just to stay afloat, to curb their appetite until payday. I share all of these food stories, my own or from people who I know or I've heard of, because I wanna highlight that there are a million sto food stories in this room and beyond, right? I can't hit on all of them because there are so many and because I can talk till the cows come home, but they're happening. Statistics tell me that some of you may have gone hungry. I know that some of you had more than you needed. Some had much less. Some of you have navigated food systems outside of America and came to America and had to navigate a whole new world of food. Some of you are beekeepers and farmers and artisanal food producers. 
Some of you have a really complex understanding of the food system and want to make big change. I hope that's like all of you. I hope that's everybody in this room. <laughs> Despite where your story falls, I really want for all of us, for the good life, as Tracy K. Smith calls it, to be a little more excitement than just a glimmer of hope on payday, right? I want it to be more than one night of roast chicken, more than one night of cheapo, two buck chuck, red wine. I want for all of us, for the good life to involve much less panic, less weariness, much more security and much, much more options. I want for your good life to involve a world full of people who give a damn about you, who are asking questions, who are raising hell for you and for other people and who are really here and devoted to solving food systems issues. I want for your good life to include ratatouille bubbling away and uh, cantaloupe that is ripe to the touch every single summer and a freakishly large selection of greens in your crisper. I want for your good life to be infinite. I want for your grocery list to roll like a scroll and for you to be able to afford every single fresh food on that list. I want the good life for all of you, for all of us. I don't want it to include any more one or two nights of living like everyone else. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. That was lovely. Uh, Zoe's going to come back on stage and take us through another. Most of us can't get enough of the stuff. We love it in our morning cereal, our afternoon soda, and our evening dessert. But this rampant consumption wasn't always the norm. For most of human history, the amount of sugar in our diets was small. Just look at the numbers. In 1700, Englishmen consumed only four pounds of sugar per year. A hundred years later, that number was 18 pounds. By 1900, sugar consumption was up to 100 pounds a year. Today, Americans consume 130 pounds of sugar per year, or 82 grams of sugar per day, more than four times the recommended amount. This includes both traditional refined sugar, as well as high fructose corn syrup, which was developed in the 70s as a cheaper alternative. While high fructose corn syrup is often cast as worse than traditional sugar, their chemical components are identical, and science has shown that our bodies respond the exact same way to either substance. So we'll refer to both sucrose and high fructose corn syrup as just sugar. But how do we get here? The sugar revolution started with beets, or beet sugar to be exact. The refining process was first developed in Germany and improved on in France during a British blockade meant to cut Napoleon off from outside trade. This allowed sugar to be grown and processed in Europe for the first time. Before this, all sugar came from sugar cane, which only grows in tropical climates and requires intensive labor to harvest. By 1880, beets had surpassed sugarcane as the leading supply of refined sugar. At the same time, technical advances during the Industrial Revolution made refining sugar faster and cheaper. By 1920, a refinery processed millions of pounds of sugar in a single day, which would have taken an entire decade just 100 years earlier. Enter the four horsemen of the sugary apocalypse. Candy, chocolate, ice cream, and soft drinks. All four industries appeared in the 19th century with sugar as their defining ingredient. Candy, chocolate, and ice cream had been around for centuries, but were only made in small batches. The Industrial Revolution provided the processing machines, freezers, industrial wrapping, and cheap sugar that allowed these sweets to be mass-produced for the first time. Soda was something new altogether. First sold as patent medicines, these over-the-counter remedies required no prescription and often made wild claims about their healing abilities. Sugar was later added to give the drinks a better taste. This was the eureka moment that created a multi-billion dollar industry. Coca-Cola, Pepsi, and Dr. Pepper, known as the Big Three, each began their meteoric rise at the end of the 19th century. Combined, these companies are now worth over $350 billion. The 20th century was famously rocky, with two world wars and a Great Depression thrown in for good measure. But if you think that's enough to slow sugar consumption, you're wrong. Despite massive unemployment and food shortages, average sugar consumption increased by 16 pounds from 1920 to 1933. Turns out that for people with little else, sweets were a small and cheap vice, seemingly worth the price. 
During World War II, the U.S. government rationed its citizens to 70 pounds of sugar per year, but at the same time allotted 220 pounds to soldiers. Many in the government saw sugar as a stimulant that made American soldiers more effective in combat. The candy and soda industries took advantage of this belief, supplying the armed forces with massive amounts of sweet treats. Coca-Cola went so far as to promise their soda to servicemen at a nickel per bottle anywhere in the world and often at a loss. To make this possible, the company set up 64 bottling plants worldwide with the help of the U.S. government. This not only increased their loyal customer base when those servicemen returned home, but facilitated Coca-Cola's transformation into an international brand, saving the company millions. After the war, sugar returned home stronger than ever before. Refrigerators and freezers allowed families to store ice cream and soda in bulk. And it was at this time that a whole new sugar frontier opened up, breakfast. Soon fruit juice and sweet cereals would become staples, taking what had been a hearty meal and injecting it with massive amounts of sugar. Brands marketed their juices as healthy by focusing on vitamins and minerals. Similarly, cereal companies argued that their sugar-coated cereals helped kids drink milk. They went so far as to create cartoon mascots and even entire TV shows dedicated to selling their cereal to the young and vulnerable. Today, the average child consumes almost 50% more sugar than the average adult. This covers what could be called the desertification of the human diet. Sugar's here, but is it here to stay? Only time will tell.
imagine this. Millions are dying from a preventable disease. In the shadows, giant corporations spend massive amounts, not to save lives, but to better sell the very thing that's killing their customers. Unfortunately, this dystopian story is real. Meet the sugar industry, AKA Big Sugar. These are the guys who've been spreading misinformation about their product for almost a century. But what's so bad about sugar, you ask? It tastes great. In fact, some sugar in your diet can be helpful, especially if you're extremely active, supplying muscles with a source of energy. The problem is that Americans consume 82 grams of sugar per day, more than four times the recommended amount. This can have startling health consequences. First, there's type 2 diabetes, a disease defined by high blood sugar levels over a prolonged period. If untreated, diabetes can cause blindness, strokes, kidney failure, limb amputation, heart disease, and death. It ranks as the seventh leading cause of death in the U.S., with around two million new cases diagnosed yearly. Though diabetes dates all the way back to the sixth century BC, it was incredibly rare for much of human history, only affecting the wealthy, who had the time and money to sit around eating sweets. But in the early 20th century, American doctors started to notice huge increases in diabetes cases, as much as 400% in some cities in just a few decades. This trend continued, and today 9.3% of Americans, almost 30 million, have diabetes, compared to a quarter of a percent just a century ago. So what's the cause? Physicians and public health officials have long pointed towards sugar as the obvious suspect, since the rise in diabetes almost perfectly mirrors the rise in sugar consumption. As Americans began eating massive amounts of candy, ice cream, and soda, made cheap by mass sugar production, diabetes went from only affecting the wealthy to affecting everyone. This westernized diet spread across the globe, eventually reaching those in even the most remote rural areas, such as the Inuit people in Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. Through the 1960s, diabetes was virtually non-existent within these populations, but now 9% have diabetes, on par with developed countries. Worldwide, the number of people with diabetes has skyrocketed from around 110 million in 1980 to over 420 million today. Obesity has also gone through the roof. 50 years ago, only one in eight American adults were obese. Now it's more than one in three. Not surprising since obesity and diabetes go hand in hand and both increase the risk of heart disease, which is now the leading cause of death in the US. Today, almost one in four deaths are the result of heart disease. Enter Big Sugar. FDR once described these guys as the most powerful pressure group he ever faced. Let's look at some of their efforts. In 1928, industry leaders created the Sugar Institute. This group actually promoted sugar as a health food through ads placed in various newspapers and magazines. Later, the sugar industry decided that the best way to increase profits was by creating their very own science. So they made the Sugar Research Foundation. This nonprofit trumpeted the merits of sugar while funding research that would back up their claims. By 1951, grants worth a whopping $3 million, $29 million today, had already been awarded to academics from Harvard, Princeton, Caltech, and other research universities. Studies funded by the recently renamed Sugar Association, Inc., would directly counter research about the dangers of sugar. Think sugar can cause cavities and tooth decay? Not according to the Sugar Association. Three years later, the Sugar Association launched a huge ad campaign that extolled the benefits of sugar, especially for children. To help, they hired one of the best ad agencies in the country, Leo Burnett, and gave them a whopping $1.8 million budget, $16 million today. Fast forward to 2017, Big Sugar is still at it, fiercely lobbying against a new FDA regulation that would require nutrition labels to clearly indicate the amount of sugar in products, no matter the source. Thankfully, and despite Big Sugar's best efforts, modern science is clear. Excessive sugar consumption contributes to type 2 diabetes and other serious health conditions. Unfortunately, avoiding sugar still isn't that easy due to what is now known as added sugars. But that's a topic for another day, or in this case, another video. For more information, check out our complete sugar facts.
Morris and Advantage Capital for being here and supporting for three years. So thank you guys. Um, and thanks for what you've done to help gather everybody here this year. In the next panel, we're gonna examine uh, how to activate true change and galvanize consumers around a mission-centric campaign and the, the role that influencers can play in guiding consumer choice and sustaining purpose-driven campaigns. So I'd like to bring to the stage George Bryant, Justin Perkins, Leah Sagetti, and Katie Geegan. And if I, please, t did I get the names right? Is that a half, halfway? Halfway? Kate. Everybody waved, everybody in the I did. How do you say it, Kate? Say hi. Kate. Hey, there we go, live stream, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Joseph. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Did we get in the right seats? Yes, I think we got it. Okay, my name is Justin Perkins. Um, I'm going to be moderating today, and the uh, the panel here is going to explain how uh, explore how brands can really benefit um, from activating their purpose more publicly, and potentially with the help of influencers. So. To kind of tee this up a bit, um, I've had the opportunity to work on over 600 campaigns in my career with Care2, which is the largest social network for good. We've got about 40 million people, conscious consumers, that use Care2 to learn about healthy living through our blogger network of uh, healthy living content. And then what we're really known for is activating people through petitions. Um, we have right now probably um, dozens of people every second that we're in this room signing petitions. Um, we're growing at about a rate of a million people a month through um, word of mouth, essentially. So <clears throat> the context here is that um, over the years, we've primarily worked with nonprofit organizations. Um, that's been our business model is to help nonprofits connect with consumers and really grow. Um, but in the last couple of years, we've started to see brands uh, take a stand on, on issues that they're passionate about. So, um, and it's not only you know the seven generations of the world. It's it's other smaller brands like Fish People, who is here in the room, um, that are doing really cool campaigns and leveraging um, you know, their power wherever they are to, to make an impact and make a difference. Um, so this is awesome. And let me contrast this with about 15 years ago when I was a, um, an idealistic MBA student. And I got booed um, by my colleagues in Denver for suggesting that we might take a percentage of profits from uh, Major League <coughs> Sports and end hunger. Um, flash forward to today, um, you're going to get laughed out of the room if you're not thinking like a social entrepreneur, which is just awesome. So that's kind of the, the backdrop for the opportunity here. And, and I think um, a lot of the, the bigger CPGs that are here, um, they're actually starting to call us and say, how can we participate in this? And, and I think it's great for the people that are, have the courage to come to a conference like this to learn how to make impact and, and keep up with some of the, the smaller brands that are more fighter brands that have more freedom and flexibility to do, um, to stick their neck, necks out and do campaigning. Um, so here's the key opportunity. I mean, we're, we're in the midst of a major cultural shift where it's really literally no longer enough to compete on product. Um, and the brands that are really leveraging their purpose and their mission are forming much deeper connections with influencers. Um, and in fact, we have data at Care2 um, showing that somebody who's taken action on a cause is actually significantly more likely to become a customer. And not only a customer, potentially an advocate and an influencer for your brand. Um, so why not tie that all together? And that's, that's kind of the key opportunity, the underlying opportunity we're gonna get into today. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples here uh, to tell you more about kind of what this can look like in, in reality. So um, right after Expo West this year, uh, John Foraker, who was the former CEO of Annie's, he's gonna be here tomorrow. Um, he tagged me on Twitter and um, was starting to speak out about the Gangster Garden. Um, and many of you know Ron Finley. He spoke here the last couple of years. Um, he started this amazing community garden in Los Angeles, and the big bad bank was going to take it away and evict him. Um, so Forker saw a lot of talk, uh, and you know a lot of people were involved in sort of uh, contributing to try to promote this campaign. Um, but he really stuck his neck out and he wrote a long, long letter on, on uh, LinkedIn and just started reaching out to his network. Um, I called him and said, hey, do you want to start a petition? He said, absolutely. He called Nell Newman uh, of Newman's Own Organics and together they co-authored a petition. Um, my team got it together in three hours, had it out 
uh, published in three hours, and then our PR teams went to work. Um, within a week, we had 60,000 people had signed that petition, um, and our PR team, working with Annie's PR team, had uh, gotten interviews placed um, on a bunch of local media uh, in Los Angeles, NPR, um, LA Times, et cetera. And then when it, it really tipped is when we got onto CBS National News right before 60 Minutes. Um, and I want to kind of break down what we learned from that campaign. Um, and by the way, that, the, the backdrop of that, there was a really clear call to action, which was Ron needed $500,000 to save the garden. So um, there was a, a crowdfunding donation outlet for that. So um, the campaign won, um, and Ron was able to save the garden. It was an amazing story. Um, so let me break that down for a second so you kind of understand the key components of what happened here. First of all, John. Um, Ron had struggled for a couple of years, I believe, to, to, to try to rally support. Um, what added fresh wind to the story was John's story of, of reaching out, um, the CEO of Annie's, an influencer, a CEO, who was willing to take, kind of reach, you know, reach across a cultural divide and actually take this very courageous action to, uh, to put Annie's brand at risk, so to speak, um, and just say, no, enough. We're going to just solve this one little thing. We need some good news right now. It was in the middle of, you know, um, six months into the, the Trump era and, and people were depressed with all of the chaos going on. So we needed a win, we needed a good story. So the cultural moment was ripe. And, um, and this was all very, you know, very earnest and spontaneous and he had the flexibility to move quickly. I mean, we literally were on the phone three, you know, three hours later with the PR teams and getting it done. Um, so, in, and in this case, John really was the influencer. He, he reached out to a sympathetic network of his, of people that had influence. So, all I had to do was activate my network through CARE2. Um, and this probably wouldn't have worked if, uh, if John hadn't done that and really taken a stand. Um, so, that's, that's kind of a key part of these campaigns is you need somebody with an audience and the right audience and an influential audience and kind of, kind of help tip things. Um, and, um, the other thing is the, the spontaneity and the moment in the media. Um, the media probably wouldn't have picked it up if the storyline wasn't good. So here you had a clear David and Goliath story, Ron being David, the big bad banker being Goliath. Um, and it was very relatable by people all over, all over the country and all over the world. We had people signing this petition from all over the world. It was amazing. Um, so you have to be able to move spontaneously and quickly and take advantage of a, of a kind of a movement moment like that. Um, another example is when we worked on Cecil the Lion a couple of years ago. Um, that had such a, a heart-wrenching story about this lion that had been beheaded. A CARE2 member started a petition and then we were able to blow that up through the media and create this amazing feedback loop. Um, and then uh, you have to have critical mass. You have to build critical mass really quickly for these things to take off. And the reason is, um, I heard somebody on uh, Fox News kind of back-channeling at one point and they literally watch social media to see you know, what's trending on social media before they'll actually report it in the mainstream. And a lot of head nods here from the influencers. Um, so that's also really critical. You need, you need numbers and you need them fast, whether that's petition signatures or uh, traction in social media. Um, and then the other piece of this campaign was there was a really clear call to action. It was either sign a petition or donate. And the benefit of the petition in this case was that people were already invested by signing the petition. They were then primed to be much more likely to engage further, either to share or to donate. I think we had a share rate of about 20 or 25 percent on the petition um, that really took off. And so we've had similar experiences. We're going to get into some of their stories as well with, uh, with Patagonia, working on saving the Arctic and, and the Barriers Monument, um, working with Thrive Market in the uh, food stamps petition online, which um, a couple of folks here participated in as well. Um, and one of, the, one of our most successful campaigns was working with George Takei, who was uh, the, the Star Trek guy, Zulu. Um, he was very outspoken on um, the Muslim, Muslim ban that was happening. And um, again, sort of a key part of this strategy to work, you need, you need somebody who's willing, you know, not just a celebrity, but a celebrity with a following, and a following they're willing to talk to. And that celebrity needs to be very committed to the cause or the, brand, or the campaign and be willing to take interviews and, and be a champion all the way through, which George Takei did. We had 350,000 people sign this petition um, that George Takei really helped spark. Um, so that's, that's kind of the backdrop and the opportunity here. Um, and I think the challenge for um, somebody running a brand is that all these elements need to work together. 
um, and you have to be spontaneous enough to catch a news cycle. If your brand manager is stuck planning six months in advance about your brand-centric campaign and, and the agency work and all of the creative that needs to go into that, um, chances are you're probably going to miss opportunities like this if you don't if you don't gear your company to be rapid response. And that's the opportunity. Um, and also you have to be willing to take the risk, to risk your reputation if, if things don't go well, and sometimes they don't go well. Um, so that's the backdrop, and now what I want to do here is introduce the notion that influencers, um, in the sense of these folks who have different networks and different approach to that, um, can be influential in, in a campaign, and partnering with the right influencer for the right moment can be uh, a very powerful business opportunity for the brand to grow. So starting with Leah, um, and uh, a lot of you know Leah, she is very outspoken on a number of issues. Her whole <laughs> MO is around um, driving causes and very passionate. Um, so uh, for starters, can you share an example of how you and your network of grassroots influencers have um, worked to uh, really make impact while, while also maybe even advancing the business goals of some of the brands you partner with? <clears throat> Thanks, Justin. Yeah. Um, so my name is Leah Segeti. I own a media company, and there's three parts to how I work with influencers. I've been in the space for 10, 11 years, which basically makes me a dinosaur. <laughs> and it kind of started off as a hobby. So all of those other women that started that have these huge networks today, we all started at the same time, and we all know each other. But we work in different niches. So over those years, I've acquired um, a network of over 10,000 bloggers. And I work with them and brands. And so we work with them with brands, and you marketing campaigns, but we also work with nonprofits and on causes. And I also have the ShiftCon social media conference where we kind of bring everybody together once a year, discuss issues that really mirror our heart and work with nonprofits, you know, have scientists to speak, you know, food companies, all kinds of stuff and bringing the influencers together, you know, once a year. And then I, uh, I do um, all of my work and my content creation on momovation.com. So if you think of me, there's really three things going on. So I think um, where I had the most impact so far has been you know, when we were labeling or trying to label GMOs in California. I have a background. I used to work for the California State Assembly, so I had a background in politics. I knew what was going on. And I seized this opportunity as, you know what, we don't have anybody in the tipping point consumer area talking about GMOs. And I think this needs new messengers. And I got really passionate about food transparency. And of course, you know, my old, uh, my old work was working on these types of initiatives and, and doing a lot of consulting in politics. So I volunteered my time for, um, for the initiative. And we organized over 650 influencers across the United States and Canada, mostly in the US to talk about labeling, to talk about food transparency. At that time, there wasn't a lot of green bloggers. I mean, there, there was a little bit. You know, the, today, it's, there's a ton of them. But back then, there wasn't that many. So these were all tipping point consumers, quote unquote, mom bloggers. You know, so these women were all of a sudden talking about something that they had never talked about before. So in that time, we uh, created just over 650 million impressions in two short months. Um, it was an incredible campaign. We did online parties. We did a lot of posts, but it was just organizing all those women. So uh, that was probably the biggest impact that we made. Um, and it didn't stop in California. It actually, working in politics in the past, I knew that if we had lost by a teeny bit, people would not give up. They would get more impassioned. And that's basically what happened. So it kept going and going and going. And that platform was an amazing platform that we used to educate consumers of all kinds about food transparency, ingredients, what's in your food, hey, do you know what that is? And a lot of people that had never considered these things before that were digital moms that shopping, you know, and just, you know, love their iPhone and were following all these influencers, all of a sudden were starting to care. And this moved the needle significantly. So another uh, campaign that I, I really loved working on was Thrive Market, which Dustin was talking about. And that was, those issues were behind food access and getting um, food stamps through the USDA, but having online food stamps for those people that are in food deserts and get them to be able to purchase these, you know, organic good for you foods online instead of having to go 50 miles to find something. So for that campaign, we created just 102 million impressions. That was about, again, two months of work. Um, we had about, I would say, 40 influencers working on that as well. So I think what I would say about, um, oh, and then when I was talking about labeling GMOs, 
the brands that were really impacted by this were the ones that gave so heavily to the campaign. So the ones that we gave love to was Dr. Bronner's, Stonyfield, Nature's Path, and um, Nutiva. And so those brands all of a sudden were, you know, tipping point consumers were like, oh, Nature's Path, oh, Dr. Bronner's, you know what I'm saying? So these were brands that they were starting to become more aware of, which I think really did benefit them. So um, what I would say for that is these mission, the brands that are focusing on mission, that's kind of where social media is at right now. That's, ex especially the influencers that I work with, that's where they're going. Um, and so these campaigns that can bring in mission and focus on mission and just be part of it are being really, are, are just really successful. And influencers love it because it, it sings to their heart. Thanks. And Kate, um, as an author and speaker and influencer, um, you, and a nutritionist, which is your core thing, mm -hmm. um, can you say a little bit about how you're doing work here to work on the broken food system and, and how um, you're leveraging your influence and maybe working with brands to also um, have impact and, and what's the opportunity for them to be a part of this? Yeah, yeah, thanks. So hi everyone, I'm Kate Geegan, registered dietitian and my area of expertise really is bridging personal and planetary health. I grew up a lot like Carlotta, her story, boy did that resonate yes, with me. Yes, I went to McDonald's more than I sat at my kitchen table in high school, both my parents worked and um, Everything came out of a bag, a box, a pouch, or a can. And so really having this um, revelation as I became a dietitian and moved to a ski town, because I love skiing at heart, and seeing all the climate change models and what was happening with um, climate change, that there'd be no snow under 10,000 feet uh, in the Intermountain West by 2030, this was 2007 and I thought, oh my gosh, I wonder if diet has anything to do with that. And I went to my office and I did some research and I just said, the American diet is the SUV of eating styles. And ended up writing a book with Rodale, Go Green, Get Lean. And it was a little ahead of its time. So now consumers really are at this point of recognizing personal and planetary health. And so the way I work with brands, primarily uh, in the influencer space, is connecting with health professionals. Because planetary health in 2015, the Lancet and the Rockefeller Foundation partners to really coin that term planetary health, that the systems that the earth depends on for human health are at risk. And so let's build and connect the dots of science um, and so these are really converging, the health professional field and the food system field in a way that when I was becoming a dietitian 20 years ago, they were very siloed, everything was very siloed. So helping brands understand the opportunity with health. So um, one of my partners is Cliff Bar. And Cliff Bar, we all know, has a great origin story and a great mission. And as they have really come to evolve to put stakes in the ground around sustainability and fixing the food system, working with Cliff, not just on rapid response media around the fact that 77% of their portfolio is sustainable or organic, but helping them curate longer term, deeper relationships with sports nutritionists, dietitians, health professionals, and being able to talk in a deeper way where you can do the quick response communication, but also around organic. How do you keep it relevant? How do you tie it to the science? Are there performance issues? Now with things coming out with the microbiome and that we've mapped 23andMe, I mean, the frontier is just exploding. So helping brands find their best story and, and capture those opportunities around health that they might not even know because they're so mission and passion driven, which is awesome. Um, can you build that piece with health and then how do you have that conversation with health professionals? So that's really my area of um, expertise, helping them go deeper or being that credible source. I work with Silk on a campaign about how can the right groceries change the world where they had their network of 600 influencers, but they wanted me to help them craft the content and make sure they were really having the right conversation with those people. So I think while there is um, tremendous opportunity for like that grocery point, uh, point of purchase, with health professionals at the table because you have corporate dietitians um, influencing 300 million shopping carts. How can you maybe just make sure you're also looking at those opportunities for brands who believe they have a health story 
or as the science continues to emerge on this convergence, capturing those influencers as well in the health professional space. Yeah, I think that's an important point where you're, you're working on sort of a longer term, deeper mm -hmm. um, systemic change, yes. which I think is uh, important to think about too as you're building, especially for the startups here, as you're building uh, a brand from the ground up, um, think about what you can do even on a small scale that is part of a longer term mission. And then I had a great conversation with Roger Craven last night from Megafood and they're working on kind of regearing their their um, their purpose and, and how to activate that. And, and he's got a great way of thinking about it, which is long term and short term. So what can we do today right. that might be more of, uh, of, a, of a campaign or taking a stand on local legislation or something? Mm -hmm. Um, that can have impact now, and then longer term, here's, here's where the vision is going. So I think yeah. that's a great example of the longer term methodical approach and how you can leverage influencers to impact that. Yeah. And then um, George over here, hugs and bacon. Hugs um, and bacon. If anybody wants to bring in bacon, he likes it. He'll take um, it. And uh, <laughs> I will so, eat it. <laughs> so George, you come at this from a, a kind of a fresh angle. Um, you served in uh, the Marines and um, came into this space kind of through your own journey of, of wellness and your own personal health. Uh, and now you share your tips and your learnings with um, lots of people. So say a little bit more about your audience and also um, you know, think, thinking about your, your impact that you're trying to have through your, through your uh, work. Um, and how might brands benefit from that and, and have impact in, in collaborating with somebody like you? Awesome, thank you. Um, so this will be the quickest elevator pitch ever, but I was an active duty Marine for 12 years. I was medically separated. I got blown up one too many times to continue to stay in, so traumatic brain injury almost amputated my legs. Well, in the midst of this, I gained and lost 100 pounds and I struggled with bulimia for 12 years while I was in the middle of a desert in a porta potty. So. I'm all about authenticity, so. Um, <laughs> That's an influencer thing, yeah. So, um, He's right. He's for right. me, Kate and I were actually talking last night and I think I looked at her and I said, uh, selling is a byproduct of authenticity. Um, and it's the same thing with enrollment. So um, the bacon part of my company, which my company name is Hugs and Bacon Incorporated, is Civilized Caveman, which is my food blog. I wrote the Paleo Kitchen, you know, New York Times, all that fun jazz and I didn't know how to cook two years prior, which is awesome. So I use that as food and like healthy food and desserts as a gateway to get people souls. And then I get into the real stuff of like, hey, this is who I am. I was sexually abused, I was bulimic, let's talk about it. And the reasons why you choose to eat how you choose and make the decisions that you do outside of like why you just picked up a brownie and stuffed your face. And so the bacon, uh, the, that's the bacon part. The hugs part is I do digital media strategy and marketing for big brands, like I, collectively I'm spending $20 million a month right now on Facebook ads. So like I'm playing in a very big space. And for me, I'd say the core competency for brands and what I do with all of the clients that I work with is humanizing the brand because people don't buy from brands, they buy from people. They're not enrolled by brands, they're enrolled by people. And so the more I can get people to kind of pull the masks away and being like, yes, I may be the CEO of a company, but I'm willing to get on Instagram stories or Facebook Live and talk about my journey or talk about my struggles or the passions and reasons and purposes for why I wake up every morning and do what I do is a win for me. And we've used this across the board with companies to build communities of buyers and non-buyers alike to enroll them into things like Snap. Like Snap was a big thing that we were all a part of and all these other initiatives. But the truth is, is that I wanna create a level playing field where people, consumers, clients feel valuable whether they give us their credit card or not. And that's where I want to affect the most change. Because statistically speaking, it takes seven touch points to get someone to consume something with your brand and 26 to get them to take an action. And so that's liking, commenting, and we're not even into the buying space. So the more I can get people to go where the attention is in an authentic manner, I call them epiphany bridges. It creates more moments for consumers and customers and, and, and change makers to be enrolled mm -hmm. with a possibility of a relatability from somebody's story, somebody's mission, somebody's values, their purpose, and the things that they're sharing. And that's, that's what I'm really, really committed to. So if you have a conversation with me, I like to talk, and I like to be really blatantly honest everywhere. Social media, Facebook, everything that you can imagine, because it really makes a massive difference for people. It's what stands us out in the noise that's happening right now. Value first, you know, like getting real to the core of why we choose to do what we do. 
Yeah, and Can so I, I think add something real quick sure, about I think a lot of you might have been shocked that, you know, he's so open about things in his life that are really painful. But I think what you need to understand is that's what we do as influencers. We share our lives. We we help people understand that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. And by us sharing our lives and, and our challenges and the things that may not be cool and the really great things about ourselves, that's how we build a really, really loyal audience. Mm -hmm. So don't be shocked. This is, this is a really common thing for really good influencers. You will find stories like this with some top people and they're open about their lives. So, and, and so I think for any of you, there's, um, that's kind of the, the interesting dynamic is that it's very difficult from the perspective of a brand to build that trust and that authenticity. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you, any of you take that in a, in a way and, and help a brand in an authentic way to where it is honest and truthful and meaningful? Um, and I think that's where some of the, ac the advocacy work is, is potentially a, a way into that because then the brand can authentically say, we support this cause or this issue, and it's probably easier for you to amplify that. Yeah, um, I have, no, I have no problem talking, so I'll answer. <laughs> uh, I love you guys. I know. Um, for me, it's about documentation versus creation mm -hmm. when it comes to using our platforms as, as brands. When I come into clients, and I have massive clients, when I'm doing seven billion a year in the US, I drive it down so hard that it's not about creating or crafting the perfect message, it's about documenting how we live and the choices that we make so we can be relatable for people and create possibility for them to take action. And so regardless of the brand, there's people in the brand, in the company that have habits and passions and things in their life that allow them to align with the brand and there's people on the internet that want to consume that and follow that attractive character or that personality or that lifestyle, which is what creates all those touch points and possibilities for people to take an action or when they're in a store and they see your product, what do they remember? What's the social trigger? Oh, I remember when she spilled her coffee in her car after she was late for daycare before she went to run the company. Or there's this cold, disconnected message of this perfect, created thing that means absolutely nothing, adds no value, and further disconnects people from the human side of the brands. So yeah, so the influencer is just really putting that human aspect to it. So brands really need to be aligned with our missions. And so when they work with us, it's like, well, what is this influencer about? Mm -hmm. And so when we work with a brand, you know, it's, it's like us bringing them into our family in a sense. Because, I mean, not anyone gets to work with me because I have very, very stringent, you know, requirements of who I'm going to work with and who I'm not going to work with. And my audience trusts that this is standard with everything that I touch. So when we work with one, it, it, it says a lot that they're part of our family. And when the these companies are focused on a mission first and then just standing next to that mission and having that be okay. That's what works and sings, at least to our audience, you know, in my audience. And there's a lot of influencers that work that way. Now, there are some brands that want to come in and just be like, this is my ingredient, this is why I'm great, and da 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 da, da. And that doesn't really work today because nobody cares. You know, that's just really what it is. They want to, they want to feel something. They want to connect with something. And they, they want you to create that. So Yeah, and it's more than just a transparent ingredient list. Right. Like, that work of cleaning up ingredient lists has been done, by and large, by big and small. Yes. Right. Right. So yeah. it is, there's a difference between transparency and authenticity. Right. And that really is where partnering with the right influencer in a long-term way where it is really that win-win. So you're bringing opportunities to them and you're speaking and creating that connection so that your tribe trusts that. Um, in my domain, it's a little more of the science base, like helping breathe new life into an organic story, a sustainability story. Um, you know, plant-based is huge right now and there's, two lines, you know, sort of traditional plant-based and clean meat, vegan tech 2.0. So lots of interesting things to watch that the health community is definitely trying to play catch up in a large way to what these guys are doing. Um, but I think as people cycle back and say, okay, I, I'm excited and I'm passionate and now I wanna know like what are the benefits or where can, what can, um, deeper, I'm, I'm ready to go a little bit deeper and that's where um, a, a health professional conversation, we're seeing more and more brands stepping up to bring that piece to it as well to the public and the media. Yeah. Um, do you guys want to say a little bit about the, the Amazon campaign that you did at uh, Expo East? So we organized a campaign called Amazon for Good. And the idea was, you know, Whole Foods, 
and Amazon are now one brand. And we're also thinking about food access to people who don't have access to healthy food. Um, and the other thing, understanding that I think, I, I'm, I'm probably a little fuzzy on these um, stati statistics, but 40% of people that are um, hungry um, have access to a vehicle, but 70 of them, 70% of them have access online. So it makes the Whole Foods Amazon partnership even more relevant because this can be something to solve. So we were, we created, we did Amazon for good and we did a Twitter party and I'm trying to think, I think we did 37 million impressions. Oh, yeah. um, it was amazing. We had about 500 people there, live participants, and we were just kind of talking about how Amazon can be used to better our food supply, to bring food to real people that are struggling. Kate, do you wanna interject a little bit? Yeah, and the idea was really, you know, so so often we've, with all the tribalism going on yeah. and sort of the food conversation, I feel like Amazon is this great leveler we agree that everyone it's we all shop at Amazon so no matter what zip code you live in you have access to Amazon and so how can this connect us in positive ways um, and and ideally you know we had big hairy goals eliminating food deserts and mix um, cutting food waste imperfect produce matching it up on Amazon and getting it to hungry people um, we got a lot of and, uh, suggestions online because we were asking people yes. what are your ideas what kind of things can yeah, Amazon yes. do and people People were just like, I mean, yeah. we got like 200 or so like amazing ideas from people, and it was it was really like, it, it, yeah. everyone really felt impassioned about yeah. this, and they get the connection with the online. Um, everybody has access through their phone, basically. So, I mean, we want to keep pushing this and see if we can get a meeting with Amazon. So, if any of <laughs> you know anybody at Amazon, we really want to talk to them. We're very serious about talking to them. It's Escabona and it's us, yeah. the, the influencers. So, help us. That's the one part that we haven't been able to do is get an actual meeting with them. Yeah, and just to kind of close here, I think I want to encourage, you know, there's a range of brands here in size and resources and large and small. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a $20 million a month budget to, to participate in this. Right. Um, no. We, uh, I, I, I run a small company in Boulder called Olamomo, and we, we did a campaign when the Haiti earthquake hit. Mm -hmm. We sent an email out to our 3,000 people at that point and found out just by luck there were a couple of folks that had family um, foundations on our list, and we were able to fund um, an AIDS orphanage that was kind of off the beaten path. And, and that actually was the most press we've ever gotten, was the fact that we kind of stood up. Um, mm -hmm. we, we didn't spend any money for that either. It was just um, leveraging our network and our sort of influence in our little microcosm of the world. So I want to encourage you know, folks to think about what you could do literally today or tomorrow um, to sort of activate your purpose. Yeah. And, and these folks are amazing strategists and can help you. So yeah. thank you, everybody. Thanks. Don't I get a hug? Yes. Do you want a hug from Hugs and yeah. Bacon? Oh, yes. Do you want a hug? Oh, that's a good one. I like it. First, okay. First, first. I'll get. I'll get. Know. We'll get bacon later. Bacon later. Thank y'all. Thanks, man. Good to see you, Justin. You too. Okay. So, someone in the audience just asked me, "Can we ask questions?" And I just encourage them in the most Eskimo way. Just go straight to the person you want to ask a question to, as soon as you want to. Um, sorry, we don't have a lot of uh, question format right now. That'll change over the over the the course of the rest of this. But for now. Uh, grab whoever you want to ask a question to and just take advantage of the small format because you can do that. I'm reloading my stage notes because they're, um, they're updating. So we're using, uh, we're using uh, Keynote and Keynote then comes through the internet to my phone and then I just slide through the slide. So it's, it's cool. Denver, where's Denver? Throw your hand up in the air. Denver's the person, who, there she is. She doesn't want to be called out, but she's the one who's keeping all the notes coming in right. So thank you, Denver. So the next, we're going to have two little TED Talk formats, um, two 10-minute talks. And um, I'm just going to start this, and then the speakers will come up, and everything's preloaded from there. But we're talking about creating, creating plenty, urban agriculture and the new food pioneers. Um, so the way we talked earlier today about technology and the way food is evolving, these companies have are leveraging technology to redefine uh, opportunities to create plenty. 
So first up is Mark Oshima, co-founder and chief marketing officer of Aero Farms. I got a chance to meet Mark last night. Um, he's gonna, he has a clean tech company that builds and operates state-of-the-art indoor vertical farms in urban environments around the world. That's Mark, and then I'll introduce Michael because he's gonna come up right after you, Mark. Michael Hanahan, um, CEO of Agua Dulce Farm, which develops, employs, and demonstrates organic growing, including aquaponics and controlled environment agriculture. And um, we've heard his name many times, but, and he's in this area we haven't gotten to meet, so I look forward to meeting him too. Come on up, Mark. Thank you. Great to be here. This is really special. We've been following, and just want to give a special thanks to the New Hope team. Uh, we've definitely been following the dialogue, what Escobona is all about for years. This is really the inspiration for our company, Aero Farms. We're an indoor vertical farming company. And I'm going to share with you a little bit of a story around the background of the company. I'm going to paint the picture of some of the challenges that we're facing and some of the things that we think we're doing uniquely and how we engage the community and really address you know, these broader issues in terms of how do we increase access to food. And not only food, but making sure we can have better access to healthier choices. Um, so just to give you a little bit of sense of you know, who we are, what we're doing, uh, we're going to talk about bigger challenges than ever, new farming approaches. The idea that, again, what we're facing on a macro level is really unprecedented. So the idea of drought, access to water, fresh water, 70% uh, of fresh water goes to agriculture, 70% of the contamination is coming from agriculture. So we think about, you know, how do we think about new paradigms? We have issues with runoff. We've lost a third of our arable land in the last 40 years. Again, this idea that how do we think about different farming approaches? Uh, you can see we continue to have a very heavy dependence on pesticides, and so it's creating issues in terms of runoff and, and dead zones. And so traditional farming has more issues than ever before, and we have to think about, you know, how do we work through some of those solutions? You think about the macro issues in terms of increasing population, you know, the idea that by 2050 we're going to have 9 billion people, increasing urbanization, food safety, food security. These are issues that are making things even more acute. So the idea that, you know, how do we come up with even more solutions? Uh, when Eric was speaking earlier today, he was talking about the idea that there's actually 40% of food waste, you know, is a number that's really being talked about. When you take it back through the whole value chain on farming and take it back through this very complex supply chain through the retailer, through the distributor, through the processor, and then back to the field, for leafy greens, it's actually over 76%. So think about all that embedded energy, all that embedded work, and the idea that, again, you have something healthy and nutritious, and how do we change that equation? Uh, we talk about food safety. So this is the idea. This is really, really important. We really want to stress this because the idea that how do you come up with solutions that can really be able to address and be able to scale and be able to have the impact, uh, the food safety challenges are more important than ever. And unfortunately, we have headline news about some of the different pressures that we have. And these are major players who have very robust programs in place. And again, how do we think about in a different approach? And that's really the background in talking about who Aero Farms is and what we're thinking about doing. And so the idea of what is indoor vertical farming, this idea that we can grow indoors without sun or soil, we can convert warehouse spaces, we can enable local production and put cities, uh, the farms right in the cities where the consumers are. So when we define vertical farming, it's about how many vertical beds of growing can get stacked in a space. This is representative of one of our growing systems. And so the Aero and Aero Farms refers to aeroponics. This is a much, much more targeted way of delivering not only the water, but the nutrients. This is a way of growing that uses 95% less water, just a fraction of the fertilizer, and even less than hydroponics. And so we think about the advantages, and so it leads to a faster growing process. Uh, the idea that plants don't need sunlight, they actually need spectrum of light, leads to our understanding around plants, the biology, and how we have actually more effective photosynthesis and how we can optimize the right environment for the plants. And there are things that we're doing with our growing medium. We actually grow on cloth, that's a reusable medium. It's one of the advantages we have. It's also lightweight, but also serves as a barrier so that nothing ever touches the leaves. There's no soil to wash off, there's no pesticides to wash off, it's a clean, ready-to-eat product. And it's a reusable medium so that, again, we've been using some of the same growing cloth for years, and it's just one of the different lenses that we have in terms of environmental footprint. So the idea that we can grow in cloth and what does a healthy root system actually look like, uh, this is an example of uh, how we're able to target. You can actually see some of the little bit of droplets you know, on the roots. We can actually look at the micron size and think about how do we enhance the absorption of the macro and micronutrients. So what we're able to do real time is monitoring and looking at that plant health, how it translates into human health. Uh, from a company standpoint, we can grow a wide range of different crops. Our commercial production is really focused on short stem leafy greens and herbs so that we can get as many beds stacked in a space. It's also an area where we have some of the biggest impacts. So out in the field, baby leafy greens may take 30 to 45 days to grow. 
we can actually grow in 12 to 16 days. And then all of a sudden we're talking about the ability to grow all year round, not just maybe two or three harvests per year. So you're talking up to 30 harvests a year, it's really game changing. We think again, but how do you have the right kind of scale, right kind of operation to be able to ensure, you know, how do you bridge now good agriculture practices and good manufacturing practices. The idea that we can really optimize the plants, so the idea that we can really tailor and we can accentuate, we can optimize for taste, texture, color, even nutrition, and ultimately yield in terms of how do we have the right business model. And so we're creating these growing algorithms and thinking about, again, how do we create the right product, but it's consumer driven, customer driven, thinking about how we can develop something that has a unique differentiated product in the marketplace. As a company, just want to take a little bit of a step back. You know, this is not about a purpose-driven campaign, this is about a purpose-driven organization. From day one, we've always been thinking about all the different stakeholders. So our mission is how do we build these responsible farms in major cities all over the world to enable this local production to grow safe, nutritious, and delicious food. Uh, as a company, we're a certified B Corporation. We think it's really important that there's a transparent scorecard thinking about not only how we're doing in farming, but how we're doing against other industries. So this is one of the things that we think really connects and resonates when you think about what are some of the needs and some of the discussion earlier about the good food values and what are people looking for. Our mantra is about farming locally, globally. Uh, we're based in Newark, New Jersey. It's where our global headquarters are. We just built out our ninth farm. It's the world's largest inter-vertical farm. And it's really about, again, how do we think about taking an area that traditionally has not been known for having any kind of farming and really redefining not only the garden state but agriculture overall. Uh, we have this lens, we're part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation Circular Economy 100. The idea that, again, how do you eliminate waste? So the fact is, you know, we use 95% less water. We have eliminated, you know, the fact is our growing medium is reusable. We don't use any pesticides. So we're changing fundamentally this growing equation, the inputs and the outputs. We're also part of something called the Rockefeller Foundation 100 Resilient Cities Program. So with a strategic partner there to think about, again, how do we help cities think about food resiliency and food systems? So as a company, we're inspired. I love hearing about this concept of epiphany moments, right? So my personal epiphany was thinking about access to food. You know, even Eric talked about this issue on access to hunger, you know, access to food. You know, one out of seven people have issues around hunger. Uh, for me, in New York City, where I grew up and have been working, it's one out of five. Uh, for children, it's one out of four. I've been very involved with the Food Bank for New York City for years, and this is some of the issues that I've been always focused on from a food justice standpoint. So it's really been built into thinking about when we thought about the company, you know, again, the impact we can have in the community. We're sharing the leading the way. We've been fortunate, we've got a lot of press, a lot of number of awards. We're sharing this because in the spirit of, you know, what we're talking about, this overall theme of courage, one of the important things, and we saw this also with the Seth Godin, you know, the dip, a really important characteristic of courage, what we think is really important, is fortitude. So we're, we're, we're blazing a new frontier. There's no playbook here. So the idea that, again, we're gonna encounter things that are gonna cause our business to zig and zag. Our company started out in the Finger Lakes area in upstate New York and Ithaca. Our chief science officer was a professor at Cornell. His whole focus was deploying technology to help farmers. And then our business evolved though in 2009 with some clean tech investment saying you should really be empowering other businesses, other farms using this technology. Our business pivoted back though to being, coming, uh, to being the farmer back in 2011 when we realized this understanding of the environment, the biology was just too precious and we wanted to ensure the integrity. So as a business, this is one of the key messages I think in terms of the audience and the different companies that are emerging. Fortitude is an important part of the, of the courage as well because you need to be able to sustain and be able to go through you know, some of the different developments. And fortunately, media and awards is one of the wings that help validate that you're down a good path. We think about redefining agriculture. This is, this is really leveraging science in a new way, this idea of biology. Uh, here we're using machine vision, machine learning, and AI. The idea that we can image plants, understand, uh, map them out, look at leading indicators in terms of health performance. And it helps us optimize this particular variety, which is a ruby streak mustard green. And then more importantly is how can we do that and replicate that time after time? And it's not just what we're doing in Newark, but in farms we have in development around the world. This idea that we can deliver a beautiful product, and at the end, this is what we're talking about. Good food, how do we bring people together? It's gotta taste good, and this is what we're really excited about in terms of our focus. It's no longer, is it you know, mildew resistant? Does it travel well? Can it hold up to you know, drought? We're going back to the basics in terms of really celebrating that flavor. 
we're able to work with major food service and retail partners. Uh, we actually have a different retail brand called Dream Greens. It's really a, a platform to engage the consumer. Uh, but we're working with major you know, players like Compass Group, Restaurant Associates, ShopRite, Whole Foods, Fresh Direct. But the idea is, again, around scale and around impact. And what's been great and validating for us, too, is that key tastemakers have really gotten behind this. And so uh, David Chang, one of the top chefs, he actually serves our greens uh, in his restaurants. He's gotten so excited that he's joined us in our last round of investment. He's also joined our board of advisors to help on the culinary front. Just wanted to highlight that, again, some things that make your firms quite unique. We recently received a grant from the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. It's a million dollar grant that we're matching, but it's our ability to identify stressors of leafy greens to optimize them for the flavor and nutrition. And this is really uh, leading a new ground. So uh, the executive director calls this precision plants, uh, but United Fresh Produce Association, Tom Stenzel, the CEO, is talking about how this can drive the overall produce uh, industry in terms of, again, how do we increase consumption. Just gonna go back. But as a company, it's our impact in the communities. It's about creating jobs, it's creating you know, a year-round employment. Uh, it's, it's to be able to have this public-private partnership. So repurposing abandoned warehouse spaces. Uh, the site that I just mentioned is our ninth farm is a former steel mill. Uh, the idea that we could turn something like that into something green and productive is, again, thinking about how we drive economic development. The idea that we can bring people together, uh, one of our working farms is in a school, Phillips Academy Charter School, Michelle Obama has come to visit that as well. And the idea that again, whether Republican or Democrat, this is one thing that's been able to unite, unite people. The idea, we're talking a little bit about addressing food deserts. We open our doors right in Newark, the biggest city in New Jersey. There are food deserts. How do we increase access? It's not just the food deserts, but food swamps, increasing better choices, better options. Uh, we open up our doors, the community can come in and have access. And this idea of combating food waste, uh, this are, you know, we, we need innovative people to help partner with us to kind of think of new solutions. This is a baby kale salad that is the second harvest. This normally would be left out in the field. And what's amazing about this, this is being served at the New York Times dining room. So it takes the executive chef like Bill DeSoto to be a champion of this and saying, I'm a big believer in it. First of all, it tastes great. You know, we thought maybe there might be opportunities as an added value product, a pesto or a vinaigrette. But he's like, I'm gonna serve this right in the salad bar because this is a great product and the consumer should be enjoying it. And so this is exciting for us to be able to share these kind of stories. The idea that we're passionate about food, you know, we've grown over 250 different types of leafy greens and herbs. It's about really celebrating rich biodiversity and really bringing excitement to the category. But at the end of the day, it's about scale. It's about how we feed the masses. So this is an example of one of our farms in terms of, again, how we can really bring the farm to the consumer and really bring it you know, to the city and be able to ensure the right kind of output to have the highest levels of food safety as well as growing. And fundamentally, you know, what we're trying to do is farm locally, globally. Uh, there's a great video that just came out with uh, Mar Mario Patelli and ABC's The Chew, so I encourage you to get a chance to come to our site and see the impact we're having in the community on a couple different fronts, so thanks. We're going to turn it over to Michael. And while we're waiting for Michael, I mean, we did have a video as well to share, so maybe there's an opportunity to kind of share a, a video on, on Aero Farms. And this really helps kind of bring the scale to life and a little bit of appreciation about when we talk about converting warehouse spaces, what that impact can be.
Well, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. So cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, That's wonderful. It. Okay, you're good. You want to maybe? Okay, we'll hold on to this. Um, we're actually a slight change of plans. We're going to bring Kip Stroden up. So Kip, come on up from Local Roots. Local Roots believes that the key to a sustainable food future relies on low-risk supply chain and creating opportunities for local food production. Using technology, they are out to tackle food insecurity by addressing common problems like shelf life, price, and barriers to entry for local farming opportunities. Do you need this? I sure do. Enjoy. Thank you. That's my clicker. I believe so. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kip Stroden. I'm the brand architect for Local Roots, and we're based in Los Angeles. We're also a controlled environment indoor ag company. Uh, our focus is on building farms in a modular form factor, which today is a eight foot by 40 foot shipping container. So uh, we've invested considerable cash over the last four and a half years, tweaking that technology, investing in it, and building our patents to grow leafy greens uh, abundantly in shipping containers and then deploy those uh, all over the world. Uh, our mission is improving global health by building a better food system. And that really inspires me personally. I've been in the natural products industry for over 10 years. And uh, leafy greens uh, are an incredible, incredible uh, resource for people's health. And there's pretty much no nutritional uh, expert that doesn't recommend eating leafy greens, whether they're paleo or vegan, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, getting greens is important. It's uh, foundational for human health. So uh, some of the things that really drive us at Local Roots is this population bomb. And we have seven and a half billion people on the planet today. Uh, you know, the estimates uh, vary, but you know, roughly we're going to have about 10 billion people on the planet by 2050. And that means we're going to have to increase food production by 70%, and it's massive. And the food production systems, as you have all you know, are all aware of because you're attending this conference, are already stressed. So this is a tremendous uh, solution that has to be fixed, and technology is going to play a part. Um, oftentimes people say, oh, you're in the indoor ag space, are you going to replace outdoor farms? And absolutely not. There's um, a lot of people to feed. There's plenty of room for local roots, aero farms, and other indoor ag companies to thrive, and all of the outdoor farms as well to produce food for you know, the increasing population on the planet. Uh, this is something uh, that is not in the news today because uh, everything else, uh, there's so much politics and other, you know, less important issues dominating the press, but uh, today we have the worst humanitarian crisis in the history, or since, uh, since the UN's been recording since 1945. So there are 20 million people at the risk of starving to death in Africa. Uh, there's been a combination of, you know, six, seven years of drought and then also wars that have, you know, kind of exacerbated the situation. But this is incredible. Um, there are entire villages where every toddler has died uh, this year just because they're not getting enough nutrition. Um, the World Food Program is raising around 4.5 billion just to bring emergency aid to prevent these 20 million people from dying. Um, there's another 108 million people that are in, let's call it caloric crisis and uh, another 815 million people on the planet that um, are hungry, not getting in. And that's 11% of the population. And then on the flip side, in the, let's call it, you know, developed world, you have s over 600 million people that are obese. So there's a big gap here in our food system that needs to be resolved. And we want to be a big part of helping resolve that. Um, Food waste, which has been touched on today, uh, you know, the statistics vary, but six, let's just say in the leafy greens category, it's safe to say 60% of all produce is thrown away. That happens on the farm, that ha happens throughout the, uh, uh, the supply chain, but it's a tremendous amount of food um, and uh, makes no sense when you have, you know, 20 million people on the verge of dying from starvation. Uh, so there needs to be a remedy, and the produce industry is suffering from this tremendously. They, uh, you know, it's, it's a big economic burden for the produce industry. Uh, other challenges, pricing is very volatile for produce buyers, quality, especially with leafy greens because they're transported such large distances and in influence. Um, 
food safety is a big issue, uh, farmland is, de arable land is decreasing, and then all the extreme weather. Um, you know, look what happened to farms in Puerto Rico, in Florida, in this part of the country, uh, tremendous impact. And then uh, controlled environment indoor ag really uh, is a huge solution on the water usage issue. Um, so great solution for reducing water consumption. Uh, another thing in the distribution network for outdoor agriculture, especially with leafy greens, you know, you grow it, you harvest it, you know, it's a couple days in a pack house, then it gets processed, then it gets transported across the country, then it hits a distribution center, then it goes into, you know, retail or food service, and then to people, you know, to all of us in our fridges. Well, how many times have you bought produce and it's only lasted two days and then you throw it in the trash? So. Um, our solution, um, growing produce in you know, retrofitted high-tech shipping containers, locating those next to distribution centers actually will add 12 days of shelf life in many cases uh, for consumers and for retailers. So what's the future of food? What are we all gonna do uh, about this situation? And um, our solution is gonna be one of the solutions. And we believe bringing uh, farms to the people, to, you know, to distribution centers is at least how we're gonna participate. So this is a little mock-up of a Walmart distribution center with uh, solar-powered farms uh, on location. Uh, we are currently you know, in a contract negotiation with Walmart right now to deploy farms, um, uh, first in Southern California and then across the country. And uh, this adds 12 days of shelf life for uh, distributors, for retailers, and for consumers. You know, you buy produce at a farmer's market and it sits in your fridge and, you know, sometimes you're astounded. You're like, wow, this lettuce is still good. It's still edible after sometimes two weeks. So this is kind of the vehicle. Um, this is our retail branded product line. It is um, four and a half ounce clamshells of uh, mixed baby leafy greens, ultra nutrient dense, no pesticide, uh, no pesticides grown 365 days a year, uh, lo always local, uh, no matter where we grow. And uh, we offer, you know, we extend that shelf life to our customers and to consumers. And we, after four and a half years of research and investment in technology, this year we finally cracked our own kind of personal code and we're selling leafy greens at price parity with outdoor farms, which was a huge uh, achievement for us. So this is um, one of our Terra farms, um, uses 99% less water, produces as much produce as a five acre outdoor farm. Uh, zero pesticides and herbicides, and a lot of people don't know, you know, large-scale certified organic farms still use pesticides and herbicides. They're compliant, they're less toxic than petroleum-based pesticides, but it's better to not use any and not, uh, you know, eat chemicals that kill insects. Um, and also we can grow anywhere on the planet, so from Dubai to, you know, the middle of the winter in Alaska. This is a little bit of a reveal, uh, 3D, of our system. Again, uh, probably uh, you know, eight different patents. Um, that's an HVAC system on top, and we also grow in trays. We are, um, uh, we are not an aeroponics company. We are using hydroponics, um, so slightly different, but somewhat similar. So that's a terraform. And uh, we also have growing algorithms. We use artificial intelligence, machine learning, and uh, we are advancing that software platform. So we have engineers um, all in-house uh, building out this system and have come to you know, a point where we're gonna scale um, nationally and globally. Current customers for us, we're selling to the SpaceX campus uh, in LA to Tender Greens, um, different food service distributors, Mendocino Farms, and in 2018, we're gonna launch nationally with Walmart, and we just recently uh, inked a deal with Cisco as well to um, roll out nationally. Uh, 
We entered a competition a few months ago with the World Food Program and we're also working with them. Again, the World Food Program right now is looking to deploy $4.5 million uh, billion dollars to rescue people from you know, starvation in Africa, but they're also realizing that they're typically delivering things like rice and beans to people and not micronutrients. So they need solutions where they can bring you know, living food to people around the world in crisis areas. And our modular form factor, you know, our terraforms can be put on a train, uh, um, on a, you know, on a uh, cargo ship, uh, on trucks, and move anywhere around the world, uh, place down, uh, use water very efficiently, and be growing greens in, you know, less than, you know, about a month. So we're really excited to um, be working with the World Food Program. We're exploring a project in Egypt and in Nigeria, and uh, should be happening in 2018. So that's all I got for you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Michael. So one of the things Michael talked about was the portability of that growing system. And um, just a, a, another reminder about what happened in Puerto Rico. They lost 80% of their agriculture. Um, and again, we have a, a place to give out there. So when you consider the loss of 80% of agriculture, that's a food insecurity of a proportion that most of us can't even get our head around. So I just wanted to throw that out there one more time. Yeah, so next, this is, you know, we've been listening to things that are very much about the future and, you know, shockingly futuristic, I think, looking at food growing in trays stacked in um, industrial spaces. It's, it's wonderful and it's, it's hard to wrap your head around if you've never seen it. I've never been to a facility like that. Lunch, we're gonna go do something that's much more old fashioned. We're gonna eat together. We're gonna tell stories. We're gonna yeah. talk about our experiences that we've had <laughs> in our past, right? Yes, we are. Yeah. A food narrative lunch? Yes, and we have, do we have something to share? I think we do. We had a photo, but I don't know if they'll Did share it. make it into the internet? Do we have the technology? Oh yeah, there it is. So that's uh, that's the Butler kids. Yeah. There's, um. <laughs> there's me with something in my mouth, a fork <laughs> in the back. There's Adam. I probably had stolen something off his plate, poor gaunt soul that he is. Um, Bill Butler in the foreground there, Lauren in the middle, and Bridget off to the side with her glass of milk. Some French's mustard on the table. Yep, and, and a sad poinsettia. <laughs> um, Holiday time. So one of, our, one of the core values of our company, the Butler Bros, is, to, is home for dinner. And it's, it's literal and figurative, but it, it, what it's really about is in our life, one of, the, one of the really great things that happened in our house was our dad would get home for dinner and we would eat as a family. Yeah. And questions were asked about the day and, I, you know, recalling it, I think Adam and I, maybe there was a 70% rule in play. Our dad was a painting contractor, so he's busy and he owned his own business. But there's a lot of memories of him and, and our, both our mom and him asking us about how our day went and things would come out at the table and guidance was given. Yes. And there was a lot of home cooked food. We were uh, a, a family that struggled financially, but our mom, I loved hearing Cornell mention, our mom was a uh, farm girl from upstate New York and a Cornell grad and she was a really good cook and she put <laughs> stuff together from scratch as a really a, ma a matter of financial survival for our family. It wasn't something she was doing because she thought it was elite or cool. She just had to do it, right? Yeah, she knew that that's, that's how you saved money, really, was you, you just made stuff from scratch. And the other thing that was interesting in our house is we were, we were the house that everyone else wanted to be at because there was a lot of other kids there. And there was a little bit of the loaves and fishes thing going on where just more people would show up and then more food would be produced, which I always thought, God, how, Dad's just like, Jesus, Kathy. <laughs> We got five of our own, <laughs> and you're having more over. It was so, the yeah, it was great. It was the but, clown car fridge where food yeah, just so kept we, coming out. We've tried to do that in our own business, and we you know we try to keep our day to locked in to be able to get home for dinner and at lunch today. We want you to share stories like that with each other um, and just open up the conversation because uh, you know it, it it helps connect us as a group to kind of where we came from, where where we where we're eating from. And uh, 
Yeah, each table will have a moderator that will take us through a conversation. It's nothing complicated. Everyone will have something to share, and half of the time will be spent sharing those stories with each other. The other half of the time will be spent talking about solutions to problems that we've been hearing about already today. So, so yeah, get at a table where you don't know everybody. That's the rule. And chew with your mouth closed. You don't have to. You don't have to. Talk. Yeah. Talk. Um, while you're eating today yeah. only for a limited time. And uh, our dad was a famous uh, chewer with food, talker with food in his mouth. And it was like, Dad, come on, man. And he had so much to say. He could stop, so. It was horrifying, but he was okay. Uh, so downstairs will be uh, lunch where we were last night. Yes. Right? Like it always is every year at Escabona. And be back by one sharp. I think we have a little bit longer than that, maybe 110. 110, 110, 110. sharp. So I think we're free to Ish. go down now, everyone. Find yes. a table and enjoy. Thank you. I think we. Imagine this. Millions are dying from a preventable disease. In the shadows, giant corporations spend massive amounts, not to save lives, but to better sell the very thing that's killing their customers. Unfortunately, this dystopian story is real. Meet the sugar industry, AKA Big Sugar. These are the guys who've been spreading misinformation about their product for almost a century. But what's so bad about sugar, you ask? It tastes great. In fact, some sugar in your diet can be helpful, especially if you're extremely active, supplying muscles with a source of energy. The problem is that Americans consume 82 grams of sugar per day, more than four times the recommended amount. This can have startling health consequences. First, there's type 2 diabetes, a disease defined by high blood sugar levels over a prolonged period. If untreated, diabetes can cause blindness, strokes, kidney failure, limb amputation, heart disease, and death. It ranks as the seventh leading cause of death in the U.S., with around two million new cases diagnosed yearly. Though diabetes dates all the way back to the sixth century B.C., it was incredibly rare for much of human history, only affecting the wealthy, who had the time and money to sit around eating sweets. But in the early 20th century, American doctors started to notice huge increases in diabetes cases, as much as 400% in some cities in just a few decades. This trend continued, and today, 9.3% of Americans, almost 30 million, have diabetes, compared to a quarter of a percent just a century ago. So what's the cause? Physicians and public health officials have long pointed towards sugar as the obvious suspect, since the rise in diabetes almost perfectly mirrors the rise in sugar consumption. As Americans began eating massive amounts of candy, ice cream, and soda, made cheap by mass sugar production, diabetes went from only affecting the wealthy to affecting everyone. This westernized diet spread across the globe, eventually reaching those in even the most remote rural areas, such as the Inuit people in Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. Through the 1960s, diabetes was virtually non-existent within these populations, but now 9% have diabetes, on par with developed countries. Worldwide, the number of people with diabetes has skyrocketed from around 110 million in 1980 to over 420 million today. Obesity has also gone through the roof. 50 years ago, only one in eight American adults were obese. Now it's more than one in three. Not surprising since obesity and diabetes go hand in hand and both increase the risk of heart disease, which is now the leading cause of death in the US. Today, almost one in four deaths are the result of heart disease. Enter Big Sugar. FDR once described these guys as the most powerful pressure group he ever faced. Let's look at some of their efforts. In 1928, industry leaders created the Sugar Institute. This group actually promoted sugar as a health food through ads placed in various newspapers and magazines. Later, the sugar industry decided that the best way to increase profits was by creating their very own science. So they made the Sugar Research Foundation. This nonprofit trumpeted the merits of sugar while funding research that would back up their claims. By 1951, grants worth a whopping $3 million, $29 million today, had already been awarded to academics from Harvard, Princeton, Caltech, and other research universities. Studies funded by the recently renamed Sugar Association, Inc., would directly counter research about the dangers of sugar. 
Think sugar can cause cavities and tooth decay? Not according to the Sugar Association. Three years later, the Sugar Association launched a huge ad campaign that extolled the benefits of sugar, especially for children. To help, they hired one of the best ad agencies in the country, Leo Burnett, and gave them a whopping $1.8 million budget, $16 million today. Fast forward to 2017, Big Sugar is still at it, fiercely lobbying against a new FDA regulation that would require nutrition labels to clearly indicate the amount of sugar in products, no matter the source. Thankfully, and despite Big Sugar's best efforts, modern science is clear. Excessive sugar consumption contributes to type 2 diabetes and other serious health conditions. Unfortunately, avoiding sugar still isn't that easy due to what is now known as added sugars. But that's a topic for another day, or in this case, another video. For more information, check out our complete sugar facts.